So I want to give a very warm welcome to our guests in this meeting, Bernardo Castro and Michael James. Um, let me introduce you to them. Uh, Bernardo Castro is the executive director of Essentia Foundation. His work has been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism, the notion that reality is essentially mental. He has a PhD in philosophy, ontology and philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer engineering, reconfigurable computing and artificial intelligence. As the scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear, Nuclear Research, also known as CERN, and the Philips Research Laboratories. Formulated in detail in many academic papers and books, his ideas have been included in Scientific American, the Institute of Art and Ideas, the Block of the American Philosophical Association, and Big Think, among others. So welcome, Bernardo. And since we're both Dutch, fijn dat je erbij bent. Yeah, hartelijk dank. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah. um, Michael, Michael James, is the leading interpreter of the teachings of the Indian sage Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi, whose teachings represent the simple, deep and practical implication of all of Vedanta, the philosophical conclusion of the Vedas, particularly the non-dualistic interpretation of it called Advaita or non-duality. Michael spent more than eight years studying the original Tamil writings of Sri Ramana in close detail under the clear guidance of one of Sri Ramana's foremost disciples, Sri Sadhu Om. Together they translated Sri Ramana's Tamil original writings and Guru Vajaka Kofai, which means garland of Guru's sayings. He continues to write and talk about Sri Ramana's teachings and many of his writings and translations have been published and some of them are also welcome or also available on his website. Welcome, Michael. So let me shortly tell everyone how this meeting came to be. In May of this year, Michael had a conversation with Swami Sapapriyananda, and I understood, Bernardo, you also had a meeting with him around that time. And below uh, that video on YouTube, one of the subscribers, Mick, stated that he would love to see Michael have a similar dialogue with Bernardo Castro. And I will, I will read what he wrote in the comment. He said, I think that Bernardo is a very significant person indeed. Here we have a very highly qualified scientist philosopher who gives compelling evidence for idealism. This was bound to happen because quantum physics seems to be catching up with the eons old philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. Advaita doesn't need scientific validation as it stands alone. Personally, I think we are on the cusp of a change in scientific outlook that will be more profound than heliocentrism. Bernardo, in my humble opinion, is one of the forerunners of this cultural change. And I'm hoping that our blessed Michael will be able to chat with Bernardo. That will be a treat indeed. I thought it was such a nice comment. <laughs> so when we noticed that, um, <laughs> we immediately reached out to Michael if he was interested in that. And he said yes, and we approached you, Bernardo, and you also said graciously yes to this meeting. So that's that's how it how this came to be. So before we dive into the philosophy of um, analytic idealism and Bhagavan's teachings, let's start with the personal. And in both of your respective works, I noticed a similar search for meaning and purpose in your life. So Bernardo, how did your search for meaning and purpose led you to the or yeah led you to the philosophy of analytic idealism I, I think in the first half of my life when I was a young man I, I didn't conceive the thought of okay I need meaning or I need purpose it, it, it was a sort of implicit thing um, that didn't require explicit effort I mean my life was going in that direction in a sort of automatic uh, way I grew up in a mostly scientific environment. My father was very much into science, had a subscription to Scientific American. Um, I went to university very early. I had just turned uh, 17. Uh, and then my first job at CERN was two days after I graduated my gradu after I, I defended my graduation and thesis. I defended it on a Friday. On the next Monday, I started at, at CERN uh, in, in Geneva, which is a sort of 
cathedral of, of uh, physics uh, in the world, the cathedral of science, the, the basics of science. And I was so sort of um, in the flow with that. You know, I, I, to work at CERN was a dream I had when I was a kid. And to be there at 22 was sort of mind boggling. So I, th th there was... There wasn't a need for finding finding the purpose of my life because I sort of I was living it um, automatically. But what did happen is that um, at some point I got involved in AI, artificial intelligence, and then we had an illicit work that we did on our own time at CERN. We decided to do a AI version of a data acquisition system that we were building according to you know classical understanding of physics. Uh, we built in parallel with that, without funding, without uh, um, being officially engaged in that, we built an equivalent AI to do the same thing. And it did as well as knowledge of physics did. So the thing was intelligent enough to discriminate data from our uh, uh, events, uh, our scientific uh, experiments, um, almost as cleverly, well, as cleverly as a physicist uh, could, but much faster. And the question popped in my mind if i can make this thing intelligent what does it take to make it conscious what does it take to make sure that the data processing it performs is accompanied by experience in the same way that the data processing in my brain is accompanied by experience i experience my thoughts and uh, i struggled with that at a personal level for years and at some point i had to accept that it was a dead alley that whatever i thought about had an implication only in structure and function, and it had absolutely nothing to do with experience, <laughs> with consciousness. And I realized that um, my basic assumptions about the nature of reality, I was a sort of a physicalist by default. I never thought about it, but everybody in my surrounding surroundings were physicalists. So I, I was one sort of unthinkingly, and I realized that uh, that was not tenable. Um, at some point, I came across a paper by Dave Chalmers, the philosopher, who formulated the hard problem in the following way. There is nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we could deduce, in principle, the qualities of experience. These are completely different domains. One is pure theoretical abstraction, and the other one is reality. It's uh, the felt experience uh, of life. And uh, I, I figured that I had to trace my steps back to a point where I took a wrong turn in my assumptions and thinking about the nature of reality. And I traced it back to the assumption that consciousness is something that is created out of physical arrangements. That assumption was clearly wrong because whatever I thought about doing in terms of physical arrangements, it had a bearing only in structure and function and nothing to do with the qualities of experience. And of course, that created an enormous vacuum in my life. I didn't have any more a story in terms of which to relate to reality, to the world, and I needed a new one. So it took me a couple of years, and then I sort of arrived uh, at what I would later figure out were very similar conclusions to what the sages of three and a half thousand years ago had already arrived, which was not really a surprise, right? When things are true and real, you're bound to knock your nose against it, to bump your nose against it at some point, even if you're completely lost, eventually you bump against it. So that was not a surprise. Um, and I tried to formulate it to myself in sort of, you know, the language of my world, the language of analytic reasoning, empirical evidence, uh, and not the language of introspection, which I consider to be the royal avenue to knowledge, but it's not what it's not my strong point. I am spiritually a very hard head. I, I, it's very difficult to move me off my baseline analytic state of consciousness. And uh, the search for meaning came much later in the second half of my life. And it was already informed by idealism, informed by this notion that consciousness is primary. And, and it was not a long search. It's a, it sort of unfolds very rapidly by itself once you ask the question. Should I continue or? Well, I was, I was just waiting if you wanted to take a zip. Well, I'm kind of curious if you want to share a little bit more about that. Okay. The, 
I'll, I'll share the conclusion then because the process yeah. of coming to this sort of unfolded spontaneously over a period of a, a couple of years. Um, but where do I find meaning? I find meaning in everything. I see everything as the natural spontaneous unfolding of a field of subjectivity that nature is. That's what nature Beautiful. is. It's a field of subjectivity. And it's exploring its own potentialities uh, um, to itself. So our the meaning of our lives is to be the eyes of nature, the metacognitive, high-level thinking eyes of nature that can take explicit, as opposed to instinctual, explicit account of this unfolding. So for me, meaning resides in the realization that my life is not about me. It's not about, about Bernardo Castro. It has never been, isn't, and can never be. Um, that the meaning of my life is that of a segment of nature that is contributing to this universal unfolding of what we could call the, the mind of nature or this field of subjectivity. So uh, therein resides the meaning. It's uh, In Christian terms, it would be Meaning resides in a life of service, not in a life of personal achievement, because all of your personal achievements, uh, no, when you die, <laughs> there they go. Yeah, you're not yeah. taking them with you. Um, meaning resides in a life of service to nature, uh, which for me is a is a conscious entity. Yeah, beautiful. In I forgot now in in what book it was, but in one book you you wrote something about you've been to the cathedral in Cologne. And there you had a certain kind of, let's call it an experience. Would you like to share something about it? And it's impossible to share that kind of experience. You know, it's subtlety and nuance. I can give you hints. I can talk around it. I can't yeah. talk about it. But um, there is a, a very large crucifix in Cologne's Cathedral, right above the shrine of the Three Kings. And um, one day I was there. I mean, my girlfriend used to live in Cologne. So for three years, I was going to Cologne all the time. Now we live together here in the Netherlands. Um, and we visited that cathedral several times because it was you know, almost next door. Um, and it was a peaceful, sort of edifying place. And one day I was just sitting there without any religious thoughts. I was just sitting there and staring without thought at, you know, at the altar, at uh, that crucifix. And it dawned on me that, um, you know, that figure nailed to a cross is is a human nailed to space and time. It's a human nailed to the cross of space-time, of localization, of seeming individuality and limitation um, and separation. And, um, and that, for some reason, was in the service of God. It was in the service of, you know, of the mind of nature. And the figure hanging there was a symbol for all of us. It was a symbol for life itself. We are all nailed to the cross of limitation, seeming separation, space-time, extension. Um, and in a way that I think Jung was best at uh, describing, this is to the service of God. It is the ultimate service. So that, yeah. that, that's what came to me. Uh, and of course, I yeah. didn't capture 5% even of what that yeah. was, but it's the best yeah. I can do. Yeah. Well, you, you write beautifully about it in your book. So it kind of jumped out. And uh, I did want to ask a question about it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Michael, would you like to share yeah. your path of meaning and purpose? Mm -hmm. And that did eventually led to uh, the teachings of, I will say Bhagavan, right? for yes. Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. But from now on, I'll say Bhagavan. So for, for everyone who's watching, yeah. Uh, yes. My background is a little bit different to uh, Bernardo's. Um, I did have a sort of religious um, upbringing. That is, both my parents were born as Anglicans, and they both converted to um, Catholicism. And I don't think they're... Catholicism, from my point of view, it wasn't so deep, but it was obviously very meaningful to them. Um, so I was sent to, um, instead of sending me to Eton, where my father would otherwise have sent me, he sent me to a Roman Catholic equivalent. So it was run by Benedictine monks. 
so I had that sort of religious background. And when I was very small, I took religion very seriously. But when I was growing up, when by the time I was a teenager, I was beginning to question things. I wasn't questioning because I didn't want to believe. I wanted to know why to believe. And I asked many questions. And I remember asking one of the monks, um, um, how, how to, oh, I, I remember I asked him about, because I got the idea, maybe the mystics, Christian mystics, they maybe had some experience on which they based there. So I asked this monk about mystics. How can I learn more about um, mysticism? And uh, I was told, oh, no, no, that's not for you because you're not religious. I said, what do you mean I'm not religious? He they, he, he replied to me, you asked too many questions. <laughs> so um, that, that sort of, um, that was a big, that um, it didn't make me completely give up on Christianity, but I felt I have to find something more than this. At around about that time, I remember I was at boarding school, so I was reading voraciously rather than studying what I was supposed to be studying. I was much more interested in reading um, books like um, Hermann Hess books and uh, Tolstoy books, all sorts of uh, literature. But I came across... Um, Jung's Memories, Dreams and Reflections. And that that um, that for me was something deeper than anything I'd come across till then. And so that interested me a lot. So I, after leaving school, I went to university to study psychology. But psychology in university is nowhere near as deep as Jung. So I was not sure whether this was what I really wanted to do because I really, I wanted to get down, to get to something deeper. And then I had a vague idea. I was just a teenager. I had a vague idea in my mind. India is a spiritual country. Maybe I'll find something in India. But I knew nothing about Indian spirituality. I had a vague idea. Buddhism had come from India. And um, there are many sages of India. That's all I knew. Um, so at the age of 19, I, I traveled overland to India. And I spent about 18 months traveling around, visiting many ashrams, doing meditation courses, visiting pilgrimage places, walking in the Himalayas and everything, reading whatever books I came across, um, Alan Watts' books, um, Aldous Huxley's perennial philosophy, translations of the Bhagavad Gita, basically whatever I could get my hands on. And they all interested me, but I... I didn't really feel I found what I was looking for until um, that is during the course of my travels when I was in Sri Lanka, I I met a couple from, uh, I think they were from Newcastle, and they asked me whether I'd heard of Ramana Maharshi. I said no. And they had a translation, you no, know, they had a, a biography of his by Arthur Osborne, and they showed me about his death experience that he had at the age of 16. So I read that, and that kindled my curiosity. Um, so a few months later, I came to Tiruvannamalai, and but knowing almost nothing except what I, that about that death experience, and I thought I'd maybe stay a few days. But when I went there, I read um, I read Who Am I, which is an English translation of a of a of a possibly most important prose writing of um, Bhagavan, and as soon as I read that, I don't think I understood it very deeply, but as I understood it enough to to recognize, oh, this is what I've been looking for, because before it, what immediately struck me at that time was before knowing anything else, we first have to know ourselves, because whatever we know about anything else is filtered through our mind, through through what we take ourselves to be. So without knowing what we ourselves actually are, we can't, whatever knowledge we have about anything else is open to question. When, when, the, when the identity of the knower is unclear, whatever knowledge the knower has is open to question. So 
I, as soon as I read that, I knew this is what I'd been looking for. And I lived in Tirunamalai for the next 20, 20 years or so. Most of that time, I thought I was going to spend all my life there. But external circumstances in my life changed, and I came back to Europe. But my dedication had been always, I mean, this had been, uh, ever since I read that book, Who Am I?, this has been my life, um, studying and trying to put the teachings of Bhagavan into practice. Yes, and for whoever is watching and isn't familiar with Tiruvannamalai, and that was... Uh, Tiruvannamalai is the, the town where uh, Bhagavan lived for 54 years. Yes. As a 16-year-old boy, he traveled there and he lived there for the rest of his life. And a little bit, I, of, I've, I know a little bit more, of course, about this because people are seeing, uh, who aren't familiar with you, are seeing a mountain or a hill bes behind you. And that's Arunachala, uh, oh, which, right. yes. which attracted Bhagavan uh, to, to go to mm -hmm. Arunachala, which is in Tiruvannamalai. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To give a little bit of context. Okay. Right. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. I think I even heard some new things <laughs> that you shared. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... This gives you a little bit more uh, information about uh, the meaning and purpose path in your in your uh, in your personal lives. Um, so let's go to the philosophy part right now. And I already mm -hmm. heard um, Bernardo say a little bit about it, and also Michael. Um, and Bernardo, I was watching some of the videos of your online course, which was very interesting. Um, and I, I think I saw it at the end of one of one of the videos and that immediately uh, caught my attention because it's at Essential Foundation, a new scientific perspective on reality. And um, Bhagavan also wrote a philosophical, a philosophical poem, which is called in Uladu uh, Napadu in Tamil, but translated it means 40 verses on reality or 40 verses on what is or on what exists. It depends on how you how you translate that. And um, so I immediately thought that would be an awesome subject to talk about, the nature of reality, because I'm, yeah, you can tell all about it from the perspective of analytic, analytic idealism. And Michael can talk about it from the perspective of, perspective of Bhagavan's teachings. Um, and that will, event, that will automatically lead to all kinds of other um, subjects that are related to that. So... Uh, Bernardo, I would have liked to, I would like to invite you to tell about the uh, about that perspective from the the, the, the viewpoint of an analytic idealism of the nature of reality. So the, the central idea under analytic idealism in all forms of objective idealism is that uh, there is a world out there, all right? There is a world beyond our seemingly individual minds, between the, a, a world beyond the ego, so to say. Uh, a world that we cannot control just by fantasizing about it being different or by wishing it to be different, a world that would still be there even if we were not here, a world that will be there when we are no longer here. There is an objective world, objective from our point of view, but that world is mental. It is subjective from its own point of view. And you can relate that to my thoughts from your point of view. From your point of view, my thoughts are objective. You cannot change my thoughts merely by, by thinking them different. My thoughts would still be here even if you were not there. Um, my thoughts are outside your seemingly individual mind. In exactly the same way, under analytic idealism, there is a world out there. It is outside our seemingly individual minds, but it too is mental and subjective from its own perspective. Just, just like my thoughts are mental and subjective from their own perspective, even if they are objective from your perspective. And why do we see a physical world then, a world with these colors and forms and geometrical relationships and dynamics that we observe around us through perception? Under analytic idealism, perception is a dashboard representation of the real world. Think of it like an airplane's dashboard. An airplane has sensors that make measurements on the states of the sky outside the airplane. And the results of those measurements are presented to the pilot in the form of dashboard dial indications. So the dials convey accurate and important information about the external states of the sky. 
but the dashboard isn't the sky. It just represents the sky because it's useful to, to represent the sky that way. So in exactly the same way, under analytic idealism, what we call the physical world on the screen of perception is a dashboard representa representation of the real world outside, which is in itself constituted of mental states, not my or your mental states, but its own mental states. And when we measure those mental states with our own sensors, like our eyes, our eardrums, the surface of our tongue, the lining of the nose, the outer surface of the skin, we measure those real <clears throat> mental external states or conscious states. And the results of those measurements are represented to us, just like in the airplane, in the form of a, a dashboard representation. That is the physical world. So the physical is a, a useful, important representation of the real mental world out there, of which we are dissociated psychic segments. And that do sort of dovetails with Jung and Freud and the notion of dissociation that in the 21st century is an empirically established uh, notion since the advent of neuroimaging 25 years ago. We know that uh, in, in mental space, even the mental space of a person, consciousness can seemingly break up into seemingly disjoint centers of awareness that have their own illusory sense of individual identity separate from the others. That's called dissociation. Um, uh, a patient with dissociative identity disorder, when that patient dreams, in one quarter of the cases, the different dissociated so-called alter personalities of one and the same patient can even see and interact with one another in the context of that shared dream. So the idea here is that we are dissociated segments, dissociated psychic complexes of this one field of subjectivity that nature is. And uh, as dissociated segments, we can perceive the world as opposed to being the world. And life or biology is what this dissociation looks like. It's the appearance of the dissociative process, just like dissociative processes in the brain of a patient with dissociative identity disorder. If you put that patient in a brain scanner, those processes look like something discernible. You can even make a diagnosis based on that. In the context of the mind of nature, uh, we don't need a brain scanner because we are within it. There is no skull to separate us from the rest. So we just need to look around uh, to identify the, the extrinsic appearance of other dissociative complexes or other alters of the mind of nature. And what that looks like is life, biology. And therefore, the end of life is the end of the dissociation. It's the distinction between perceiving the world as if you were outside it, inside the cabin of the airplane, and being the world, returning to the sky outside, as opposed to being surrounded by that dissociative boundary represented by the aluminum skin of the airplane. And just to link it back to, to Ramana Maharshi, um, when he was dying of cancer, uh, people were desperate asking him not to go. I don't know much about him, but I know this. And uh, and then at some point, he got exasperated um, with people thinking that he would be gone when he died. And he said, but where am I going to go when I die? Where do you think I'm going to go? <laughs> where is there to go? And, and, and the idea was, I'm going to be where I have always been, which is right here. And, uh, and I thought that was, that was tremendously insightful. Um, because it dove dovetails so well with analytic idealism. Under analytic idealism, when we die, it's the end of our dissociation. It's the reintegration of our seemingly separate conscious point of view into the surrounding cognitive environment, which is where we have always been, which is this world, not another world. So when you die, where are you going to go? <laughs> uh, it's only your experience of the world that changes from perceiving the world to being the world. But you're in the same world you have always been, and you always be. There is nowhere to go. It's it's where we have always been. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, um, Michael, I would like to invite you to answer the same question: What is the nature of reality from the perspective of Bhagavan's teachings? Okay, um, my answer is going to be a, a little bit different, and there are some things, but. You have said, Bernardo, but I would like to question you about later. But first, I'll talk about the nature of reality. That is, according to Bhagavan, 
reality means what actually exists. If something actually exists, then it is real. If something doesn't actually exist, even if it seems to exist, it is not real. According to Advaita, what actually exists is one only without a second. So what is real is only what actually exists. So whatever whatever defining characteristics of of what actually exists. Um, there is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 16, in which Krishna says, this is, this is a very core principle of Advaita, Krishna says, there is no existence of what doesn't exist, and there is no non-existence of what does exist. That, what that implies is, what exists must always exist. What doesn't always exist, well, how Bhagavan expressed it, Bhagavan used to say, what actually exists must always exist. Whatever exists at one time and not at another time doesn't actually exist even when it seems to exist. There's a reason for this. That is, to say that something actually exists means it must be intrinsically existent. If something is not intrinsically, if something is intrinsically existent, it must always exist. Things that are not, that exist at one time and not at another time are not intrinsically existent. So whatever is not intrinsically existent, but seems to exist, must derive its semi-existence from something that actually exists. Ultimately, they must derive it from something that actually exists. Existence, obviously, is not a property, but it can be, this idea can be, um, it, it is analogous to a property in a certain, I mean, it is useful to take it as analogous to a property to illustrate what is what is meant by this. That is, if we, if you consider something that is hot, if you have a bowl of hot rice, say, rice is not intrinsically hot. Since it's not intrinsically hot, it must have gained its heat from something else. It must have borrowed its heat or derived its heat from something else. So the hot rice derived its heat from boiling water. But the water is not intrinsically hot. It must have derived its heat from something else. It derived its heat from a hot pan. But the pan is not intrinsically hot, so it must have derived its heat from something else. It derived its heat from a fire. The fire is intrinsically hot, because whenever you have fire, it is hot. So this is just to illustrate the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic. So whatever is extrinsic must derive, must be derived from something that ultimately derived from something that is intrinsic, like the, the rice der is derives its heat ultimately from a fire, though there were various uh, links in the chain before it reached the rice, um, it derives its, exist it, its heat from the fire. In the same way, all things that seem to exist derive their semi-existence ultimately from one thing that actually exists. According to Bhagavan's philosophy, and this is also very much, I mean, Bhagavan's, just one word about Advaita philosophy. Advaita is, a, is um, an interpretation of Vedanta. Vedanta, the primary sources of Vedanta, the oldest of the Upanishads, which are part of the Vedas. They, 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 there is what is called the Vedanta Prasthanatreya. Prasthanatreya means the triple source of Vedanta. So the earliest source is the Upanishads. Um, the other two sources are the Bhagavad Gita and the Brahma Sutra. The Brahma Sutra is something like a, a philosophical summary of the Upanishads, but it's, in, it's, it's expressed in sutras. Sutras are like aphorisms. So the Brahma Sutra can be interpreted in many different ways. So the different interpretations of Vedanta all based their interpretation on these three sets of texts. 
and the Upanishads, there are there's things in the Upanishads that can support all the different interpretations of Vedanta. Um, uh, because, uh, like all spiritual teachings, different there are different levels of teaching given to suit people at different levels of spiritual development. So Vedanta caters for people at all levels of spiritual development. So from the Advaitic perspective, Advaita is the ultimate in interpretation of um, of Vedanta. Um, the other, of course, those who who interpret Vedanta differently, they will not agree with us, So, but, but we're not here to fight with anyone. They say, I'm talking from the Advaitic point of view. But even within Advaita, there are many different levels of understanding, because not all, that is, when Adi, the, a lot of, of Advaita is based upon the commentaries of Adi Shankara on the Prasthana Treya. Adi Shankara tried to broaden the appeal of um, Advaita to make it more acceptable to a broader audience. So he often, his, he, uh, um, his commentaries were often written for those who were not naturally drawn to Advaita. So often he had to... Um, say things in a nuanced way and often in a little bit diluted way to suit different levels of understanding. So since the time of Adi Shankara, different people have understood his commentaries and understood Advaita in different ways. Bhagavan pointed out that in Advaita, the ultimate regarding the existence of the world, the creation of the world, the ultimate truth expressed in Advaita is what is called ajata. Ajata means uh, unborn. Ajata is, according to ajata, nothing has ever come into existence. What is alone exists as it is. Not only has nothing ever come into existence, nothing has ever even appeared to come into existence. So ajata is quite contrary to our experience. We can all say, oh no, my experience disproves that because obviously, something very even if it's this is not real at least it appears to exist at least it seems to exist so ajata is as bhagavan said ajata is not a teaching it is the ultimate truth but teaching has to be given to suit those who need the teaching and those who need the teaching are obviously those of us who are aware of the semi existence of this world whether it actually exists or not is another matter. At least we, we're aware of an appearance of a world. And we're aware of us ourselves as if we're a small person in this world. And consequently, we have problems. And to, to uh, we are caught up in what is called samsara, this, um, this uh, embodied existence. So it's for us that teachings are given. So Bhagavan pointed out there are two... For, uh, that is, ajata is the ultimate truth. So that's contrary to our experience. So that is not to be taken as a teaching. For in ajata, there's nobody to be taught and nobody in need of any teachings. And I mean, what is alone is as it is. So the highest level of teaching in Advaita is what is called uh, um, drishti shrishti vada. Drishti means seeing. But in this context, it means perception. That is not just seen through the eyes. It means but all types of perception. So shrishti means, sorry, drishti means perception. Shrishti means creation. So according to drishti shrishti vada, there is no creation um, other than perception. That is, that the world does not exist independent of our perception of it. And the classic illustration of this is dream. In dream, we experience a world that seems to exist, that seems to be outside ourselves. But that when we wake up from a dream, we recognize that that dream world had no existence independent of our perception of it. So according to Drishti Shrishti Vada, this waking state is just a dream. 
And so exactly the same applies to this world. So that is the perspective, the core teachings of Bhagavan are given from the perspective of Drishti Shrishti Bada. However, most people are not willing to accept this. They will ask so many questions. So for, for people who are not ready to accept this, Advaita comes down one step to what is called Shrishti Drishti Bada. Shrishti Drishti Bada means creation precedes perception. So according to what, what you expressed in your um, in your introduction about the world does exist, that is basically Shrishti Drishti Bada. And there are, of course, many different types of Shrishti Drishti Bada. Most of the uh, religious creation stories are forms of Shrishti Drishti Bada. Most scientific views about the Big Bang or whatever people consider to be the, the origin of the universe or whatever, they're all Shrishti Drishti. The universe exists there and we are born into it and we see it. Even forms of, of idealism, such as your the analytic idealism that you um um that, that, that you that is your point of view even that is a form of shrishti drishti bada because you still believe that, that the world exists independent of our perception of it so anyway i i, I just say that as part of the introduction so you're aware of where i'm coming from so coming back to this thing about existence because Bhagavan talks from the perspective of um, Drishti Shrishti Bada, that is, that there's not, nothing exists independent of our perception of it. Incidentally, if you read the books, you'll find often Bhagavan will be talking from the Shrishti Drishti perspective, but that's according to the needs of people. But in his original writings, his core texts, it is clearly um, Drishti Shrishti. He's talking from the the perspective, but nothing exists independent of our perception of it. So uh, from that perspective, Bhagavan says, all objects exist only in the view of the subject, the subject being ego. So, so objects de derive their seeming existence from the seeming existence of ourself as a subject or ego. Um, and that ego itself is not real, because ego appears in waking and dream, it disappears in sleep. Anything that appears and disappears is not, is not real, um, according to this, the Advaitic definition of reality. So where does ego derive its existence, its semi existence? Ego, as Bhagavan pointed out, is the adjunct completed awareness, I am this body. In other words, ego is that I, but it's always aware of itself as I am this body, I am a person, I am Bernardo, I am Michael, I am Sandra. This, this identification with a, with a body. When Bhagavan talks about body, he's not just talking about the physical body, because we never experience a physical body in isolation from certain other elements. So... There's a verse in Uludunapdu in which Bhagavan says, the well, body is a form of five sheaves. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. The five sheaves means the physical form of the body, the prana or life that animates the body, and the mind, intellect, and will that function within it. So these five are called the five sheaves. So when Bhagavan talks about body, he's referring to all five because we never experience ourselves as the body in isolate. We never experience ourselves as a dead body. It's always a living body. So the body and life are always part of our experience. We never experience ourselves as a sleeping body. It's always a, a body that is seemingly awake. Even in dream, we, we seem to be awake. So the mind, intellect, and will are functioning within that body. So this packet of five sheaves is what we experience as ourself. So when Bhagavan says ego is the false awareness, I am this body, what he means by body is not just the physical form of the body, he's referring to all these five sheaves. And in this, in this term, when they talk about, when it's talked about mind, intellect, and will, mind in this context, because mind is a term that has many different meanings. According, I mean, we have to understand the meaning of the term mind according to the context. In this context, mind means the grosser functions of the mind, 
um, perception, memory, thinking, feeling, emotions, and so on. That is what is classified as mind. Intellect, we all know what is intellect, the judging, discriminating, discerning aspect of the mind. And the will is all the, in its grosser form, the will is all the likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, hopes, and fears. In the data, they talk about vasanas. Vasanas are the seeds that give rise to all these likes, dislikes, and so on. Vasanas are, uh, the term vasanas are best translated in English as inclinations. So we have certain inclinations. Those inclinations give rise to likes and dislikes. Likes and dislikes give rise to desires, fears, and so on, attachments, and so on. So this is the will. So this is what makes up the person that we take ourselves to be. Ego is the I that is aware of itself as I am this person, I am this body. So ego is an adjunct conflated form of awareness. That is the, uh, the pure I is just pure awareness. But in the case of ego, it's mixed and conflated with adjuncts. As um, So we're aware of ourselves as this, this bundle of five sheaves called body. And so long as we're aware of ourselves as this body, we're aware of other things. So the world exists, in our view, only when we rise as ego and consequently are aware of ourselves as I am this body. So according to Bhagavan, the, the world, all phenomena, phenomena of all kinds, mental, physical, whatever, all derive their seeming existence from the seeming existence of ourself as ego. And ego, as I say, is the adjunct conflated awareness, I am this body. In that adjunct conflated awareness, this body is, a, is the adjunct. The essence of that is the, is the pure awareness, I am, which is the awareness of our own existence. That, according to Advaita and according to Bhagavan, alone is what is ultimately real. So ego derives its semi existence from the real existence of ourself as I am. I am is pure existence, pure awareness, and also pure happiness. That is what is called sat, chit, ananda. Sat means existence in the sense of what actually exists. Uh, chit means awareness in the sense of pure awareness, and ananda means pure happiness. This is what we actually are. So all... all that alone, according to Advaita, is what, and according to Bhagavan, that alone is what is real. That alone is what actually exists. Everything else is an appearance. And it, there cannot be an appearance without someone to whom it appears. That is all of Advaita says the world is um, vibhata. Vibhata means an illusory appearance. But Bhagavan is always emphasizing the practical implication of Advaita. So Bhagavan asks us the question, yes, it's all an appearance, but to whom does it appear? Obviously, it appears to me. So we, to, to find out the truth of what is known, we first need to know the truth of the knower. So we first need to investigate ourselves and know the truth of ourselves. Then only can we know the truth of everything else. And the truth of everything, ultimately, is our own being, the pure awareness I am, the awareness of being. Is that, um, does that make any sense to you, Bernardo? You may I not think agree it makes with it, more but does it at least make sense? <laughs> it, it makes more sense than I think you suspect. I, I don't think we are saying different things. Maybe it's yeah. an, a matter of words. So let me try to share some thoughts uh, yeah. with you. Um, you started by trying to make the, this, this distinction between appearance and true existence. And you said yes. true existence is what always exists, doesn't yes. come and go. It's what's always there. It's the background that gives existence to appearances that yes. don't really exist because they are just appearances. Um, in, in Western analytic philosophy and Western science, we have the exact same idea. It's implied in the concept of reduction. Yes. When things are merely appearances, we call them epiphenomena. Yes. And when things really exist, we call them fundamentals or yeah. primitives. Yeah. And the two are related through reduction. For instance, if you put very hot air in a cylinder and you seal it off, there will be a lot of pressure inside the cylinder. 
but you can explain the pressure in terms of the movements of molecules of gas inside the cylinder. So the pressure doesn't really exist. The pressure is an appearance. It's an epiphenomenon. What is really going on is the bouncing around of gas molecules. But you can explain the bouncing around of gas molecules in terms of atoms and their properties. So that bouncing around doesn't really exist. It's an appearance. What really exists are atoms. But wait a moment. You can explain atoms in terms of subatomic particles and those in terms of quantum fields. So the only thing that really exists are quantum fields. Everything else is epiphenomenal. Everything else is appearance, weak emergent characteristics of the thing that truly exists. And in the grand unification theories that um, we are trying to develop, we want to collapse the current 17 quantum fields plus gravity. We want to collapse all of that into one unified field. If, or I would say when we succeed in doing that, then that unified field is the only thing that exists. Everything else is just appearance. So we have the exact um, same idea, just we just using different terminologies. Now to make it more accessible to, to the viewer, think of what truly exists as a quiet lake. And think of the myriad patterns of rippling and whirlpooling that can manifest themselves on the lake as appearances. Why? Because there's nothing to a ripple on the lake, but the lake. You cannot go and fish out the ripple and take the ripple home with you, leaving the lake behind. The, the, the ripple is not a thing. The ripple is a doing of the lake. It's an activity. It's a behavior of the lake. All the whirlpools you may see in the lake, they too are behaviors of the lake. You cannot grab a whirlpool and take it home with you, fish it and, and lift it off the lake. You can't do that. So there are no ripples. There are no whirl whirlpools. There is only the lake. There is nothing to ripples and whirlpools but the lake that ripples and whirlpools. Um, so the lake is the fundamental. So uh, under analytic idealism, all there is is one field of subjectivity. That's all there is. It's the only fundamental, the only ontological primitive. And when I say a field of subjectivity, I mean exactly that, a field of that which precedes experience itself, the, 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 the vehicle, the carrier of experience is subjectivity. So the idea is that there is only one unified, unitary field of subjectivity in all of nature. And the apparent diversity of things are just the ripples of that unified field of subjectivity. And our seemingly separate identity is just the whirlpooling of the lake. A whirlpool seems to be localized. You can delineate the boundaries of a whirlpool and say, here is a whirlpool. It's here and it's not there. In the same way that you can delineate the boundaries of my body and say, well, Bernardo is here and not there. But there is nothing to Bernardo other than that field of subjectivity, just in the same sense that there is nothing to a whirlpool but the lake which is doing the whirlpooling. Bernardo is not a thing, it's a doing of nature. And that doing then becomes registered as an appearance that we see, like a whirlpool that we can see and delineate the boundaries and say there is a whirlpool. So even under analytic idealism, only what is always there, the background of all the ripples, all the whirlpooling, the thing that is doing the rippling and whirlpooling, that's the only thing that exists. Everything else is appearance. Everything else is doing its behavior. It's not things. It's not true existence. Uh, everything else is epiphenomenal, um, illusory. You can, you can put it that way. Insofar as you think a ripple is a thing, then that ripple is an illusion. It's not an illusion if you understand it to be what it actually is, which is a doing, a verb, a behavior uh, of the lake. So I don't see a departure there. Now, um, there was something I wanted to talk about, but uh, that you touched upon and you saw as a potential difference. Oh, yeah. The idea of things existing only to the observer. Um, because I said in the beginning, there is an external world out there that doesn't depend on us. Um, I can use the word I or we or us, the first person pronoun, um, in different ways depending on the context. Um, in one way, what I mean by we or I or us is the illusory, seemingly individual we or I or us. Um, 
but I always qualify it by saying the seemingly individual, the seemingly separate, because illusions exist as such. They exist as illusions. Um, an illusion is an experience that exists as such. What we think it to be is not true, but the thinking of that, which we call an illusion, that exists as such, as an illusory thought, a, a, a wrong thought. So the individual I exists as an illusion. And I think it's important that we acknowledge to people that uh, their illusions exist as such, as illusions that it's not a complete non-existence, that there is a dynamic in the mind of nature that leads to an experience that we wrongly identify as a separate self. It's not true, but the illusion exists as an illusion. It is one of the ripplings of, of the lake, so to say. It's not a thing, but it's a behavior, a behavior of mind, a behavior of consciousness. So from the point of view of the illusory separate self, there is a real external world that does not depend on the separate self. Now, this should be tautological to you, N not to the vast majority of people listening to this, I think, um, but to you, it should be tautological. Whatever reality is, it cannot depend on the existence of an illusion. <laughs> so the real world does not depend on the illusory individual self. So from the point of view of the illusory individual self, there is a real world out there. But from the point of view of the true self, which is unitary and it's the same in you, in me, and in all of nature, it's the lake. From the point of view of the true self, there is no external world. Of course not. Because the true self, which philosophers in the Western tradition are now calling core subjectivity, in other words, it's pure subjectivity without a narrative of self, without that story, oh, I am this person belonging to this race, born on that date at that place, and I do this and that for a living. Like when we say, I am a doctor, I am an engineer. No, it's what you do. Doctoring is what you do. Engineering is what you do. You are not that. But we misuse the verb to be a lot in the English language, at least. Um, from the perspective of this narrative, there is an external world because this narrative is confining, it establishes a boundary. But from the perspective of the thing experiencing the narrative, in other words, the fundamental, the primitive, the thing that truly exists, there is no external world because it is the external world as much as it is the narrative, the illusion. It is doing the external world as much as it's doing the illusion of an individual separate self. So our true selves are core subjectivity. Subjectivity without a narrative of self. Subjectivity without memory, without concepts. That's identical in you and me. Not because these are two identical copies, but because it's one and the same thing. It's not two. It's not two, but one. Uh, and it is also the ripples that we register in perception as the dynamics of the world outside, outside us. It's one lake. From the perspective of a whirlpool in the lake, there are ripples outside the whirlpool. But the whirlpool is not a thing. Neither are the ripples. There is only ever just the lake that is whirlpooling and rippling. And I think that is the sense in which Ramana Maharshi said, well, there are objects only from the point of view of the illusory individual self. I, I agree with that. Objects are delineations of the contents of perception. And the contents of perception are a dashboard representation. They are not the world as it actually is. It's a kind of representation that we create for ourselves, and it has useful purposes. I mean, I need to know to which mouth to bring the spoon so I can survive. So there is this thing that we call a spoon and a mouth on the screen of perception. It's useful, but not real in an ultimate sense. Uh, it's on, it only exists as an illusion, as a representation on a dashboard, not as the real states of the sky. So insofar as objects are contents of this, the screen of perception, of course, they only exist to the seemingly individual perceiver. Of course, the screen of perception is not part of the world as it is. It's inside us. So objects to exist have to exist to a seemingly individual subject. And that seemingly individuality, seeming individuality is itself an illusion. 
it's like a whirlpool. A whirlpool looks at the ripples around it, and when the ripples interact with the boundaries of the whirlpool, the whirlpool registers that there are ripples out there. That's perception. And perception then depends on there being a whirlpool. But again, a whirlpool is not a thing. It's a doing. And so are the ripples. The only thing that is ever going on is the lake. There's nothing but the lake because everything else can be reduced to the lake. In the same way, under analytic idealism, there is only universal consciousness. Everything else can be reduced to universal conscience, consciousness, including the seemingly separate alters that we call ourselves, that we call life or individual identity or biology or body or organism. These two are just ripplings and whirlpoolings of the one thing that exists. So I don't, I don't think we are as, sep as different in views as you may have thought. Okay. Does the, you, you seem to be saying the, the pure subjectivity is itself the world. Yes. Does that mean that the pure subjectivity is undergoing change? I don't think subjectivity itself can ever be something other than what it is. Right. Um, but it can behave in different ways. And some of these behaviors can reveal to subjectivity things about what it is that have not been expressed or manifest before. So it can perhaps gain more explicit awareness of what it is, but that increased awareness of what it is doesn't change what it is, has always been, and will always be. So it doesn't change, but maybe its apprehension of itself evolves without that implying any change in what is, if you know what I mean. Uh, so you're you're saying what it is remains unchanging, but at some level there is change. Again, it's it's how we define the words and how we keep them accessible to the to the public in terms of their colloquial meanings. I think nature is what it is. Mm -hmm. Or subjectivity, that field of subjectivity that nature is, it is what it is. It can never be what it is not. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, at a fundamental level, it doesn't change. Yes. But what it is entails certain potentialities of behavior. Just like a person, um, a kid that has grown up in absolute poverty, may have the, pot the tremendous potential for a deep appreciation of art. And that's part of what the kid is, will always be, and has always been. It, 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 it does not change. The potential for appreciating art will never change. It is always there. It's what the kid is. But if the kid never goes to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam or to the British Museum, that potentiality will never express itself. When the kid goes to a museum and sees a, a Van Gogh, that kid can cry, can become moved, swells of emotion can come up, tears. Um, so there is a difference between a potentiality that is always in what is expressing itself or not. If that kid never goes to a museum, then that potentiality that's part of what the kid is doesn't express itself. But if the kid does go to the museum, then it expresses itself. But the kid is the same kid in both cases. What the kid is, is unchanging. It's a matter of what potentialities of what is get to be expressed or not. So I think nature or this field of subjectivity is always exactly what it is. It's identical to itself, as Jung likes to put it. That's Jungian terminology for this core existence. It's always identical to existence is always identical to itself. It doesn't change, but it can express what it is in different ways. And it may or may not express depending on circumstances. And it is by expressing what it is that it comes to know itself at another level, at a more metacognitive level to use technical language. So I think there is a sense in which things change because they can express or not but that's not a fundamental sense i think when you go to the fundamental level of nature the primitive level what really really is i think that never changes i think it's incoherent to think of it as changing because 
if something is the sum total of reality and there's nothing outside of it, then however it changes has to be an intrinsic potentiality that it already had, because what else? There is nothing else. In other words, at the level of intrinsic existence, what is, is, it never changes. Change is an expression of behavior that betrays what already was before that behavior was expressed. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but this potentiality, in whose view does this potentiality exist? Obviously, potentiality exists from our point of view uh, as the observer of all this. But in the view of the pure subjectivity, is there any such thing as potentiality or expression of potentiality? No, no. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we are always making concessions to colloquial assumptions in order to right. be understood. So I, I was making a concession to the fundamental existence of space-time, particularly time, yes. because expression happening or not is time-bound. Yes. You know, because if if there is no time, then whatever can be expressed is expressed. It, right. It's eternal. It is. Uh, it, right. it, it doesn't. There isn't a past in which it was not expressed, and a future right. in which it might express itself. Um, outside extension or outside space-time, uh, everything I said. Um, doesn't hold. Yes. Um, e expression is a projection onto space-time of something yes. that in itself is absolute and eternal. And space-time, in my view, is not an objective scaffolding of the world out there. Space-time are the, the scales of the dials in our internal dashboard. It's the way our cognition has evolved to organize data about reality without overwhelming our our own cognition. It's a kind of filing system for data about the world that prevents cognitive um, overload. That's what space-time is. Space-time are categories of our cognition. They are not fundament a fundamental scaffolding of the world out there. So if space-time is not out there, then there is no such a thing as an expression or not of a potentiality from the point of view of the core subjectivity as it is in itself, because there is no time. So whatever can ever be expressed it, it is already <laughs> an existent. So from that point of view, no, there is no dynamics. There is no behavior in core subjectivity. What we call dynamics and behavior are projections of the properties of core subjectivity onto the cognitive dashboard uh, that has space and time as scales dial scales that's all there is but again most of the times i'm talking to western people who do not have the the, the, the sophistication of thinking beyond space time they don't have the language it's it's very difficult to think outside space time because space and time are built into our language and we think in linguistic terms in the west so from from the perspective of space time which is uh, most of the times I'm conceding to, um, there is such a thing as an unfolding, as a learning, as a gradual expression of potentialities. But from the point of view of the primitive, the fundamental that is expressing itself, there is no such a thing as a gradual expressing. There is only what is, because that isness is eternal. And, and eternal doesn't mean that it lasts forever. Eternal I mean, it's an appeal to the ether. It means it's not in space and time. It's outside uh, time. Yeah. Independent, yeah. 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 Um, there was one term I saw you um, when I was just trying to get an idea of your analytic um, idealism. In one of your papers, I you used the term TWE, that which experiences. That which experiences from the perspective of Bhagavan's teachings is ego. And according to Bhagavan, space, time, and everything else exists only in the view of ego. In waking a dream, we rise as ego, and consequently we experience a world which is bound by time and space, or, or which is 
within the framework of time and space. So the world and the entire framework of time and space all exist only in the view of ego, that which experiences. Now, um, so, so that which experiences is the ego. That that was yes. um, how we came to it. Yeah. But you said earlier, the ego doesn't really exist because it ceases when we sleep. It ceases. Yes. So it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't actually exist, but it seems to exist. Yeah. So long. So long as we are experiencing anything. But when we there, there, there is that is, there couldn't seem to be an experience without there seeming to be something that is experiencing it. Okay. So so the ego doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. Yes. It's not a thing. Yes. So things that don't exist cannot experience because they don't exist. So there is e something that okay. is doing the experiencing. Okay. That's not the ego. Okay. I hinted at this a little earlier. As as Bhagavan clarified, ego is the adjunct conflated awareness. I am this body. It is another term that is used in Sanskrit for it is chit jada granti. Chit means pure awareness. Jada means what is not aware. And granti means a not. So chit is the pure awareness I am. The body is jada. It's, it's, it, the body has no um, sentience at all. The body means all the five sheets. Uh, uh, um, the, the, the body, the life, um, the, um, the mind, the intellect, and the will. These have no, um, no awareness at all. That which is aware of itself as I am this body, I am this bundle of five sheaths, that is ego. So ego is a conflation of what is real, namely I am, and what is unreal, namely these adjuncts. So though ego doesn't exist as such, it has an element of reality in it. And that element of reality, the pure awareness I am, is what gives light to ego, enabling ego to know other things. Light here means awareness. So ego's be aware. Ego borrows both its existence and its awareness from the one real existence awareness, right. namely the pure awareness I am. So that which the ego borrows is existence. Its existence from is what I was trying to refer to with that which experiences that's that's what i meant because even if the ego is an illusion something has to be ex experiencing that illusion something that exists has to ground the existence of all the illusions so e that is what i refer to by twe but i the the pure i am does not experience anything all it experiences is itself that is pure awareness is aware I am and nothing other than I am. It's it is um they there are two terms Bhagavan used in Tamil, but um, I translate in English as um transitive awareness and intransitive awareness. Transitive awareness means awareness of objects, of phenomena. So awareness of anything is transitive. But the fundamental awareness, the pure awareness is um is uh intransitive it's it, it's it's not awareness of anything it is just awareness that that pure awareness even to say awareness is aware of its own existence again this is where language gets in the way of clarity because if we talk about being aware of existing of existence it sounds like existence is an object of awareness which obviously it is not so the simplest way to say it, pure awareness is aware I am and nothing other than I am. It, it, I am is obviously not an object of awareness. That is, awareness is aware of itself, but without itself being an object of its awareness, by being itself, it is aware of itself. Um, because it is awareness and awareness cannot we, we awareness must always be aware of itself 
it, it can only be aware of itself because yeah, there is yeah. nothing else going on. I, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am with you that um, core subjectivity, the thing that exists, yes. does not have its existence defined in terms that are, fam are familiar to the ego. Yeah. That which exists does not define its existence in a way that depends on the distinction between subject and object. Yeah. But if we acknowledge that illusions exist as such, as illusions, in other words, as epiphenomena, as secondary, derivative things that don't yeah. have intrinsic existence, but exist as illusions, we ultimately have to ground that through a series of reductions to something that does exist, because otherwise yeah, we are yeah, denying yeah, yeah. illusions. Yeah. And if we deny illusions, then okay, then then what is there to, to talk about? Yes. So something that is real, some aspect of core subjectivity must, must be the experiencer of all illusions even if it doesn't need to define its own, own existence in terms of the illusions. Otherwise, you deny illusions. That, that aspect, if you want to call it that, but I, I wouldn't call it an aspect, that is the pure awareness, what actually exists, is just as it is. It doesn't undergo any change. Uh, as, as Bhagavan says, from that, something called I rises. That thing called I that rises is ego. And only in the view of ego do all other things seem to exist. So though ego as such does not actually exist, it seems to exist in its own view. I agree with that. So this is, this is, this is, this is the... And um, you use the term core subjectivity, where, where, it's, where it's in Vedanta, it's uh, Sudha Chaitanya, pure awareness, because subjectivity, that, that is, it, this is just a, a use of, I mean, I wouldn't use the term pure subjectivity for, for pure awareness, because from the perspective of Vedanta, the subject is ego, but and it's only in the view of it, that is the subject is subject only in relation to the objects. So yeah. it is beyond subject. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not trying to quibble about the language, but I'm just just for clarification. I think the the term pure subjectivity is a little bit. Uh, I would question the appropriateness of the term. Uh, I'm, but, I'm sensitive to that. If yeah, you yeah. define subject in a way that uh, presupposes or requires a split between subject and object, Yes. then core subjectivity is the wrong term. Uh, yes. I, I don't define it that way. Um, right. The way I define it is subjectivity is that whose excitations are experiences. In the same way that a guitar string is that whose excitations are musical tones, and that a lake is that whose excitations are ripples, subjectivity is that whose excitations are experiences, not only perceptual experiences, but also endogenous experiences like thoughts, emotions, insights, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, nirvana, uh, all yeah. of that. So from this perspective, you do not need a separate object for the term subjectivity to have meaning. Uh, even if the entire universe is a lake and there is nothing beyond the lake, that lake can still ripple in boundless different ways, giving rise to the entire richness of phenomenal experience without there being anything other than the lake. The, just like a guitar string can vibrate in many different ways to produce many different notes without ever ceasing to be the one guitar string, and without there ever being anything to those excitations but the guitar string in motion. So all experiences, including egoic experiences, including illusions and delusions, too are excitations of core subjectivity, which does not need a core object to exist. Because variety is not defined in terms of an interaction between two, 
variety is now defined in terms of the excitations of one. But that, but one, the <clears throat> when there's when excitation is experienced, there's an the excitation creates this subject object split. It it creates the split between seemingly individual subjects and objects. But I would say yes. the core subjectivity does not require objects to exist because it's the thing that is being excited. Okay. This, this is where there's a slight difference because according to Bhagavan, the, the excitation is only for mind or ego. But the pure awareness, there is no excitation. You could say that... Um, the true lake is a lake at rest and that every rippling of the lake distorts our apprehension of what is really going on. Yes. So the true existence is core subjectivity unexcited. That would be my yes. terminology. Yes. Uh, what is an unexcited core subjectivity? Well, by definition, it's not an experience because I just defined experience as an excitation of core mm -hmm. subjectivity. So core subjectivity itself is not one of its excitations. It's not yes. an experience. In yes. the same sense that a lake is not its ripples. Yes. Because if the ripples end, the lake is still there. Yes. Um, so the identity goes only one way. Um, so I, 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 I can imagine that in the search for what is core, what is fundamental, what's primary, one wants to see even past the excitations of what is primary and try to get to that which can get excited prior to it being excited. So one doesn't get uh, confused by you know, all the dances of behavior, all the dynamics of the excitations. We want to know that which is excited at rest. The problem is that that's not an experience. It's like asking an eye to see itself without a mirror. The eye that does the seeing can't see itself. It can only see itself by reflection. So there is a sense in which what is can only know itself through its own behavior, which then can be experienced by itself. And that behavior will reveal to that which is its own intrinsic potentialities. And now I'm, I, I'm presupposing time, so bear yeah, with me. Yeah, so we yeah, can, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and if, if there are no excitations and there is only pure awareness, then it's not an awareness of any particular experience. It's core subjectivity at perfect rest. I, 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 I think it's inevitable to think that this is what's going on, but I can't even begin to imagine what it is like. But you're experiencing it even now. Indirectly. Through the excitation. Not indirectly, directly. The one yeah, thing, yeah. the one direct thing that we all experience is I am. I am uh, is ever unchanging. Yeah, that which is excited is ever unchanging. Um, yeah. The lake is the same regardless of the specific pattern of ripples uh, that that can occur. But um, if every experience is an excitation then in the absence of excitations, there is no experience. And that's what I truly am, and you truly are. I understand that. Yeah. I'm fully with yeah. you there. I just can't conceive of it in a pure way. We, we don't have to conceive of it because we are experiencing it. Even now, we are all aware I am. Our existence, our very being, is that coarse subjectivity, as you call it. But... but now, though we are always aware I am, having risen as ego, we've conflated this, uh, this pure awareness I am with a set of adjuncts. So we, now we are aware of ourselves as I am, but we're not aware of ourselves just as I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am Bernardo, I am Michael. And, and I see that this is a delusion. And, yeah. and in, according to Bhagavan, it's only in the view of that which is aware of itself as I am Bernardo or I am Michael, that there's any excitation at all. The first excitation is the rising of this adjunct, that, that is um, 
There are some verses in Uludunapadu in which Bhagavan, um, they're written in Tamil poetry, but I, I think perhaps it, it would be, you may be interested to know what Bhagavan says in this, because this is what, this is Bhagavan's um, description of the nature of ego. And it's core to understanding all these things. So would you, would you like me to um, read to you the meaning of these Tamil verses and explain what Bhagavan is saying there? Sure, sure. If Sandra is um, okay with uh, us doing this, um, I'm okay. All right. Okay. Um, the this is this work that Sandra mentioned at the beginning, Uludu Napadu. This Uludu means what is. That is what you what you're referring to as the core subjectivity, the ultimate reality, what alone actually exists. What is described in the Upanishads as ekam eva advaitiam, one only without a second. That is what actually exists. It's pure, pure being, pure awareness. Um, and that is in in this verse, that is what Bhagavan refers to as sat chit. Sat means being or existence. Chit means awareness or consciousness. But it's not it's not awareness of anything. It is the pure awareness. It's not the existence of anything. It is pure existence. So that is that is what Bhagavan refers to here as sat chit. So he says, um, the insentient body does not say I. When he says the body does not say I, firstly, what he means by body, he's not referring just to the physical form of the body. He's referring to all the five sheaves, that the body, life, mind, intellect, and will. It's jada because it has no awareness of its own. And he says it does not say I. That is a metaphorical way of saying it is not aware of itself as I. Then the second sentence he says, Satchit Udiyadu, Satchit does not rise. That means Satchit, there's no rippling. Satchit is ever as it is. Then he goes on to say, um, in between one thing, I, rises as the extent of a body. That is, because it, because it rises, it is not Satchit. And because it is I, because it's aware of itself as I, it is not the body. So it's neither the body nor satchit, but something that rises in between. What Bhagavan means by in between is it's, it, that term in between has a lot of significance here. That is, that is the only link between satchit and all of manifestation. Is, is satchit the only thing that truly exists? Satchit is the only thing that truly exists. Then, the doesn't being, e th then doesn't everything that arises ultimately have to arise from such shit because there is nothing else? No. Everything what rises from such shit is this I. It, the, the, the I that is, rises to the extent of a body. In other words, the I that is limited to the body. Only from that does everything else rise. But even if everything else is an illusion of the I, if if that illusion exists as such, as an illusion, and Satchit is the only thing that actually exists, then acknowledging the illusion implies that it, it has nowhere else ultimately to arise from, but the Ultim only thing. Ultimate, ultimately, it all arises from Satchit. Okay, yeah, okay. But fine. what Bhagavan yeah. is clarifying here, if, if you... This is clarified in a couple of verses further on. So um, if, if, if I can finish explaining this, yeah, because yeah, sure. it, Bhagavan taking it in a step-by-step -step process. So um, uh, this I rises as the extent of a body. From the, the way it's expressed here, it may sound, it may superficially seem that there are two things. There's a body and there's Satchit. And between, in between them, something rises. That is, if we read it literally, but we need to, this is a very deep and subtle subject. So words are always a limitation. So Bhagavan clarifies further on, but that is not actually the case. But so, but 
for the time being, we'll just stick with this verse. So he says, in between, one thing rises. When he says in between, firstly, it means, as I said, it's the only link, but that is this I is the only link between Satchit and the body and all, all, all other manifestation. In that sense, it's in between. It's also in between in another sense. If, um, if uh, I hear a story and I'm not sure whether it's true or false, if I ask you, is this, I read this story in the newspaper, is this true? You may tell me it's neither true nor false, it's somewhere in between. What do you mean by saying it's somewhere in between? It's got elements of truth and it's got elements of falsehood. It's neither entirely true nor entirely false. So in that sense also, this, this in-between means, because this I that rises, it's, as Bhagavan says, it's, it's limited to the extent of a body, but at the same time, it's aware of itself as I. So it borrows its existence and its awareness from the pure existence and awareness, existence awareness called Satchit. And it borrows its form from a body. So it's neither this nor that, but something in between. And then he goes on to say, this is Chit Jadagranti. That's a term I used earlier. Chit means the pure awareness, Satchit. Jada means what is not aware. That refers to the body. Granti means a knot. So it is the knot formed by the seeming entanglement of pure awareness with um, with what is not aware, in other words, with object, with an object, this body. Um, so it's 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 not entirely devoid of awareness, but it's not awareness in its pure form. It's an adjunct completed awareness. And then he goes on to say, um, this is this is Chit Jadagranti, Bandham. Bandham means bondage. That is, so long as we rise as this eye, we are bound to all these limitations. So this is what is called bondage. And this is what, in Indian spirituality, the, all, all forms of Indian um, spirituality, in fact, all forms, except for um, the materialistic philosophies, all other forms of Indian philosophy, um, uh, whether um, what is nowadays described as Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism or all, all of these, they all are seeking liberation from this from bondage. Liberation is the, um, the the ultimate goal of all philosophy, all Indian philosophy. Um, so bondage is this is this we when we rise as I and limit ourselves as the extent of a body, that is bondage. That is jiva. Jiva means the the soul, the, the individuality. Uh, nupame, nupame means subtle body. Um, this, it, it, this is here for a particular reason. I need not go into that now. Ahande, ahande means ego. Each samsara, this samsara, manam, mind. So what Bhagavan is saying, this I that rises, that is neither satchit nor the body, but that rises in between as the extent of a body, this is this chichar granti. It is bondage. It is um, it is uh, uh, the soul, the individual soul or jiva. Um, it is the subtle body. What, what in some contexts is described as a subtle body. It is ego. It is samsara. Samsara means the the entire. Um, I mean, all, the entire world is samsara. But the, the entire embodied existence, and minded existence, we can say. It is mind, mind in the sense that is, as you're, I'm sure you're very well aware, the term mind is a very difficult term to define because it's used differently in different contexts. Here, he's using mind in the sense of, that, that if, we, if we analyze mind, mind is basically, as he says in a number verse, mind is nothing but thoughts. Of all thoughts, the root is the first thought I. 
That is so mind, and, and that is what mind essentially is. So out of all the thoughts that rise in the mind, there's one thought I, that is ego. All the other thoughts exist in the view of that one thought. So that one thought is the root. So what the mind essentially is, is just the subjective the subjective aspect of the mind, that is ego, the experiencer, that which experiences, T-W-E. So mind in that sense. So that's one verse. He's, he's, he's there distinguishing ego from the body, which is what ego takes itself to be, and from the pure awareness I am, the pure existence awareness I am, which is the core of what ego is. And then in the next verse, he goes on to say, he in the next verse, he describes ego as a formless demon or formless phantom. It's formless because it has no form of its own. And it's a phantom or demon because it's, a, it's got no substance of its own. It borrows its form from the body and it borrows its substance, its existence and its awareness from such it. So, as a formless phantom, it has no exist. It has no separate existence. So, how does it come into existence? He, well, this is what he describes in this verse: "Urupatri undam." That means grasping form. It comes into existence. "Urupatri nekom," grasping form. It stands. "Urupatri undu meka ongom," grasping and feeding on form. It flourishes abundantly. Uruvitu urupatram, leaving form, a grass form. Tedinal otum pidicum, if sought, it takes flight. Uruvatra peya hande or, um, such is the nature of this formless phantom ego. When he says grasping form, it comes into existence. The first form, it, that is, as soon as we rise as ego, we grasp a, a body as ourselves. To be more precise, we project and grasp a body as ourself. If we consider dream, for example, as soon as we begin dreaming, we experience ourselves as a person in the dream, as a body within the dream world. So as soon as the dream begins, the, the body is projected that we take to be ourself, and through the senses of the body, the world is projected. So as soon as we rise as ego, simultaneously, I mean, the rising of ego entails projecting and, and taking a body to be an I. So grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. That is, without experiencing a body as I, ego cannot stand for a moment. So throughout the waking and dream state, we experience a body as I. Um, and then he says, grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly. That is, having, having identified ourselves as I am this form, I am this body consisting of five sheaths, we then experience so many other things. We experience thoughts, perceptions, memories, and so on. This is the food that feeds and nourishes ego. Because so long as we are, so, so long as we are experiencing things other than ourselves, our attention is moving outwards, away from ourselves towards other things. Since ego cannot stand for a moment, with, so, so that is the food that nourishes and sustains ego. And since ego cannot stand for a moment without grasping form, if it leaves one form, it grasps another form. But then he says the most important sentence in this verse, and this is, the, this is something that has not been made clear, that though Bhagavan's teachings are the essence of Advaita, he has also made the... Um, he he's made Advaita so much more practical. He's presented it in terms that but make the practical implication of Advaita so much clearer. That is that this sentence he's in this sentence he says, if sought, it takes flight. What he means by if sought, if ego, instead of going outwards, grasping other things turns back within to try and grasp itself. In other words, if it seeks its own reality, it will take flight. That is, it will subside and disappear. In other words, we seem to be ego. We seem to be the knower or experiencer, so long as we are looking outwards and experiencing all of this. 
But if we turn our attention back within to see what we actually are, we will see ourselves as such it, ultimately. This sounds very simple, but actually this is the, this is the ultimate um, the ultimate achievement because because we have risen as ego and identify ourselves with the body, we have strong attachments, strong likes, dislikes, desires, and so on. This is the very nature of ego. That is, the very nature of ego is to constantly attach itself to other things. So having first we're aware of this body as I, and then we're aware of mine. This is my country, my family, my wife, my children, my parents, my language, my religion, my um, my philosophy, my all this I am mine results from our rising as ego. And this is the very nature of ego to have all these things, because the ego, the very nature of ego is to identify itself as a person. And the person, as a person, I, I was born in England, so I'm English. Uh, I was... Um, I'm brought up in a certain religion, so I'm a Christian, or whatever. I mean, we of course, we can change our identification. As we grow up, We things that we identify with when we were young, we may no longer identify with. But identification is the very nature of ego. So to turn within uh, deeply enough to see what we actually are entails giving up everything, giving up all our identifications, all our attachments, everything. So it is, though it, in principle, it's very simple. All we have to do is to turn our attention inwards to see what we actually are. This is something that can take lifetimes to cultivate the love to know and be what we actually are. And to the extent that we are willing to give up everything else. So this is where detachment, desirelessness, all these spiritual qualities, this is where they become essential. And there's just one more verse I'll, I'll read because this wraps up. I mean, these three verses summarize what Bhagavan says about ego. But this next verse, I warn you, this is a really radical verse, which most people will find very difficult to accept. But it follows on from everything else that Bhagavan teaches. In the next verse, he says, If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. Adalal. Therefore, know that investigating what this is, is giving up everything. Why is investigating what this is giving up everything? Because as he explained in the previous verse, investigating what this is means investigating what this ego is, investigating who am I. The nature of ego is to rise, stand and flourish by attending to other things, but by attending to itself, its nature is to subside and dissolve back into its source. Since everything else depends for its semi existence upon the semi existence of ego, we cannot investigate and know what we actually are without giving up everything else. So, this is Bhagavan's teachings. This will be something far more. If you've read, if you've read anything about Advaita philosophy, this is something far, far more radical than 99.9999% of what goes under the name of, um, of Advaita. This is Advaita in its very purest and core form. That is, according to Bhagavan, why does he say if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence? By everything, he means all phenomena, all the rippling comes into existence. The first ripple is the rising of ego. Do you... Only in the view of ego, all the other ripples exist. So if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. So ego, what now we are seeing this world, but according to Bhagavan, what we are seeing is we are seeing ourselves as the world. That's why he says ego itself is everything. 
does a two month old infant have a e have an ego in your view it's so long as if there's any subjectivity any awareness of anything there is an i but is aware of it it may not know so, the uh, word i but it is aware of it it, it as a subject is it is experiencing the phenomena around it so a two month old baby would have an ego not the baby doesn't have an ego the ego I, I experiences itself as a two month old baby so that is ego... you bernardo the... doesn't have an ego there's an ego that is aware of itself as i am bernardo so the ego precedes the existence of the baby but yes it precedes the existence of everything So the way you use the word ego has nothing to do with the way they use the way the word is used in depth psychology by Jung, by Freud, by, well, by others. No, it, it's a far deeper meaning. But ultimately, what is ego? Ego is a simple, I, I mean, in, in English, we use a, a word that is from both Latin and Greek, meaning I. And so basically, it, that's what in the, the Tamil word, ahande, that Bhagavan is using here, is... Um, is is a Tamil form of a Sanskrit word, a hunter. A hunter simply means I-ness. So is the ego associated with Bernardo? Did yes. that ego exist before Bernardo was born? Yes. So Bernardo, the ego, pre-exists. No, Bernardo... Bernardo is not the ego. Bernardo is what ego takes itself to be now. So the ego is impersonal. The ego always identifies itself as a person, but it is it precedes the person. Is the ego associated with you the same ego associated with me? <laughs> okay, this is this is another uh, that is the implication of this teaching. I I know this is something that I, I, because yesterday I was just to, to familiarize myself with your ideas. I listened to one of the or I listened to parts of a discussion you had with uh, Rupert Spira. And um, one of the topics was solipsism. Bhagavan's teachings are a form of solipsism, but a very deep and nuanced form of solipsism, not solipsism as it is usually understood. Because usually people, when they understand by solipsism, I'm the only person, everyone else exists in my view, the I there is the, is me, this person. I, Michael, am the only person, and all these other people exist in my view. Bhagav the solipsism that Bhagavan teaches, what in Sanskrit is called Ekajiva Vada, which means the contention that there's only one jiva, that is not saying that there's only one person. In a dream, we, we, we are the dreamer. As the dreamer, we experience ourselves as a person within the dream. And we, in the dream, we see many other people. And so long as we're dreaming, those, because we, as ego, identify ourselves as a person, we identify every other person as an ego. So it seems to us that every person is an ego. And is consequently experiencing the world. So, so long as we're dreaming, if you ask anyone in your dream, do you see this? Yes, of course I see it, just like you do. It, it seems to us that there's a, a shared experience of many egos experiencing one world. That's how it seems in the dream. I, I don't have but, a problem with that. Yeah, uh, but it, there's only one, that, that actually no person in the dream is experiencing anything. Not even the person we take ourselves to be. The whole dream is experienced only by ego. So there's nothing special about the person we take ourselves to be. That, that person we take ourselves to be is no more real than any other person. So it, it is a, it's a very deep and subtle form of uh, solipsism in that Everything exists only in the view of the dreamer. The entire dream exists in the view of the dreamer. So 
according to Bhagavan and according to deeper forms of Advaita, such as uh, Godapada's Mandukya Karika, there is no distinction between waking and dream. What we take now take to be waking is actually just another dream. The dreamer of this dream is ego. But as ego, we always identify ourselves as a person. So though this entire, though we, when we are dreaming, the entire dream is our own creation. But we don't seem to have control over it. If we're being chased by a monster, we're, we are afraid and we run away and hide somewhere. If we're hanging on the edge of a cliff, we're afraid of falling. We can't just will, but we don't fall. The dream is not under our control because in the dream, we experience ourselves as a part of the dream. So as a I part understand of the all dream, this, we, we, we are not, the, we are not, the, we are, though it's actually our creation, we don't take, we experience ourselves as a creature rather than the creator. And so we impose all these limitations on ourselves. I, I understand this. It's it's yeah. only one core subjectivity experiencing the dream of reality from all points of view. I understand that. I'm trying to figure out in what sense you use the word ego. Because for me, core subjectivity is impersonal. It's the one field of subjectivity that underlies all nature. It's TWE. And the word ego becomes useful when we want to speak of a sort of a illusory individuation, an illusory sense of personal identity that's when the ego as a word uh, becomes useful because before that you know one unitary universal ego it, it it doesn't add anything to saying well one unitary universal consciousness why why do we need to use the word ego there so for me ego it, regardless of the details of how the word is used it it always appeals to some individuation some individuality some sense of yeah. separation but you just said that uh, Bernardo's ego preceded Bernardo's birth and your ego preceded your birth. So are these two egos already individuated before we are born? And if so, are, are they identical or are they one and the same and therefore not individuated? What do you mean by the word ego? That, that's okay. what I was searching for. Uh, again, dream is very helpful to, under, to clarify this. Supposing we were having this discussion in your dream, you, you, you're talking about Michael's ego, but the M Michael and his ego exist only in the view of yourself, the dreamer. Even Bernardo exists only in the view of yourself as ego. But in your dream, you only ever experience yourself as one person. So in the dream, you experience yourself as I am Bernardo. And because you experience yourself as I am Bernardo, you see many other people who seem to be just like you. So, so long as we're dreaming, so long as we're looking outwards, there appears to be a multiplicity of egos. But all those that. many egos exist in, the view, in whose view? I understand. In the view of you, you, a dreamer. You are talking about what is ultimately true. And, yeah. and and I, I don't disagree with anything you said. Right. Our shared waking reality is akin to a, to a dream. Mm. And it's the same dreamer looking out from my eyes and looking out from your eyes and looking out from Sandra's eyes. I understand that. There is only one dreamer taking every point of view within the dream. Do, in the dream, how many points of view do you take? I am taking only one point of, point of view right now. Yes, yeah, but uh, the dreamer always takes only one point of view. What I'm trying to discern is not your view of what is ultimately true. I think yeah. I understand that. Yeah. What I'm trying to discern is much simpler and more uh, parochial. And I'm trying right. to discern in what sense you use the word ego. Ego is the dreamer, the experience, the one who has projected and experiences all this. So your ego is the same as my ego? My ego exists in the view of your ego. There is only one 
there is only one dreamer. The dreamer is experiencing itself as one person and sees many other people and assumes that every other person seems to be just like itself and so seems to be an ego. That, that's the truth of what's going on. I understand that. Yes. What I'm trying to understand is how you differentiate the word ego from sat chi. What is the difference between right. ego and the one and only? The one and only never rises. It just is as it is. What rises is ego, and in the view of ego, everything else arises. Everything else appears only in the view of ego. That's why I said earlier, the ultimate source of everything is such it. But the immediate source of everything is ego. That's what Bhagavan is saying in this verse. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. So what 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 he implies thereby is that everything exists only in the view of ego. So ego rises from Satchit, projects everything else. So the, the source of everything else, the source of all phenomena, is ego, because it's all a projection of ego. So it all exists only in the view of e ego. So Bernardo is as much a projection of ego as Michael is. But the difference, the only difference is Bernardo happens to be, it, the ego happens to be experiencing itself as I am Bernardo. So your ego is a state of consciousness. It, it's not a seemingly individual entity. It's a transpersonal that's why, thing. That's why Bhagavan says it, it's, a, it's formless. That's, it's got no limitation. But as soon as it rises, it, 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 it's got no inherent limitation. It's got no inherent identity or limitation. The forms are all limited. But it cannot, it cannot rise without a, a projecting and taking a body to be itself. So the, the, the very nature of ego is to limit itself as the form of a body, which is its own projection. But if ego is simply a state of consciousness and not a seemingly individual agent, then I would submit to you it's not useful to use the word ego. Maybe a better trans maybe it's better to invent another word. Because ego it comes from the Latin I. Yes. Which which is evokes a sense of individual identity separate from the world, separate from others. Because so of my the ego is mine and your because of the identification with the body, that's what they, they, all of this appears in the view of ego. But ego seems to be a small part of this because it identifies itself as a body. I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Michael. What, what, I'm, what, what I'm questioning is I, I cannot make myself representative of your entire audience, of course. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as far as this one person is concerned, the use of the word ego in the way you mean it uh, is, is confusing because just about everywhere else in every field of knowledge, ego is always used as a way to differentiate an individual subject from others. So my ego is mine, your ego is yours. Uh, the, it, it's not a general state of mind, but it's appeal to an individual agent, whether it's illusory or not. Because it, uh, yeah, sorry, you you finish. You know, okay, no, I, I, I finish. It's yeah. okay. I, I understand what you're saying, but that is precisely the point. That is, ego is ego only when it limits itself, as I am this person, I am this individual. So ego is always it, 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 is always individuated. That is, as soon as we rise as ego, we rise as ego, identifying ourselves as I am this body. But then the ego it, cannot pre-exist the birth of the individual. It, it, it pre it, ego is the individual. It pre-exists the birth of the person that it takes itself to be. That is, the though, ego though, be ego, though ego is now aware of itself as I am Bernardo, Ego is not limit. That is a bit. That is a, its present identification. But when in a dream we identify, we we dream, we we 
we dream, but we are a person within our dream world. When the dream comes to an end, the dreamer continues. So the dreamer continues dreaming one dream after another. This is what is called samsara, the, the chain of the, the cycle of birth and death. That is the very crude understanding is that when one body dies, we, we transmigrate to some other body. But this is a far more sophisticated explanation of this cycle of birth and death. But each life is a dream. When... Well, let me ask you this. Before life arose, before abiogenesis, four billion years ago, pretend that there is no life anywhere else in the universe, just for the sake of argument. Right. Was there an ego before life arose? Was there life before ego arose? Yes. Life exists in the view of ego. That is, this, this world that existed four billion years ago, where does that world exist? It exists only in the view of that I that is now aware of itself as I am Bernardo. Do you grant any reality to our, even if vague, even if distorted and confused, do you grant any reality to the idea of a cosmological past, a Big Bang and the history of the universe? A seeming reality. So you don't grant any reality to anything prior to life? Prior to ego. Because it all exists only in the view of ourself as ego. Prior to ego, all that exists is such it. Even if our views of what might exist beyond our individual boundaries, beyond yes. our own existence as egos, our own existence as individuals, even if those views are wrong, even if they are distorted projections, mm. there could still be something that is doing the projection, that could still be a reality that precedes the existence of human beings, even if our own models of it may be confused, wrong, equivocated. That doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't anything that transcends human beings. There could still be, even if our models of it are wrong. So my question to you is, even if our models of it are wrong, is there anything that transcends the boundaries of human beings and human cognition? Um, <clears throat> I, I can give an answer, but just giving, I, I'm, not, I'm not, it's not useful for me just to state a point of view, but it's more useful to, to question more deeply. Yeah, but I need that, that to know if I can ask you the next question. <laughs> okay, 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 but there's a reason. I, I, I want to answer this question, but I can only answer this question in a fruitful way by asking a counter question. Does anything exist independent of our perception of it? Yes, I don't think anything exists in the form that appears in our perception before our perception of it, in the same way that the dials on an airplane's dashboard, they don't show anything until the airplane makes measurements of the sky outside. Before the airplane makes measurements or makes an observation, there is nothing on the dashboard. In exactly the same way, the contents of the screen of perception only exist upon observation. The physical world only exists upon observation. Even hardcore science is, is showing us that today. But the thing that is measured in order to give rise to perception, I think that does exist independent of perception. Yeah. Okay. Can can I can we can we can I bring in a, um, a another point of view? This is probably a point of view you're familiar with. This is um, Hume's take on this. I, I, I'm re I'll read a passage from. Um, an inquiry concerning human understanding. He says, by what argument can it be proved that the perceptions of the mind must be caused by external objects entirely different from them, though resembling them, if that be possible, and could not arise either from the energy of the mind itself or from the, from the suggestions of some invisible and unknown spirit or from some other cause still more unknown to us. 
that's the question he puts. And then he goes on to say, I skip a couple of sentences which aren't so essential here for brevity. I'll, I'll, he says, it, it is a question of fact whether the perceptions of the senses be produced by external objects resembling them. How shall this question be determined? By experience, surely, as all other questions of like nature. But here experience is and must be entirely silent. The mind has never anything present to it but the perceptions and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. The supposition of such a connection is, therefore, without any foundation in reasoning. The same Hume went on to deny the existence of the individual mind. Um, I know. I, he was... I don't agree with Hume entirely. <laughs> I, um, I, can, I can argue against what he says there, because what he says in that particular passage is patently absurd. He says, when I look within myself, I don't find any such principle called self. But the eye that is looking, and the myself in which he's looking, is itself the self who's, but he's denying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, there's, a, there's a logical inconsistency there. But here... Um, Purely on logical grounds, he is what he's questioning. I, I, I have never been able to find an answer to this. What grounds we have for believing that anything exists independent of our perception of it? Uh, I offer one to you. Okay. The very fact that we are here talking to one another, using the internet, using technology in the context of a shared world. If you were sitting right next to me right now, you would describe my study in a way that's very consistent with my description of it. The fact that we speak a common language betrays that there is a shared environment contributing information, the same information to both you and me. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able even to, to talk to one another. There would be no shared, seemingly external references coming from a shared world uh, for us even to talk the same language for us even to identify each other as human beings, unless you don't really exist, but as a figment of my mind, which is crass individual solipsism that I think you also deny. You, you grant existence to my consciousness as I grant existence to yours. So the very fact that we can talk to one another using shared references, like if I say car, an image will pop in your mind that is consistent with the image that was on my mind before I said the word. Where do these consistencies come from? Where does our shared dictionary come from? Where do, do our uh, mutually consistent descriptions of the world come from if we don't share an informational medium that we both inhabit? This, this is basically um, uh, Wittgenstein's private uh, language argument, I believe. Um, but well, not quite, this, but I understand that. Yeah, yeah. It, it is very similar. It is very similar. But, but there's a very simple answer to this. We could be having exactly the same conversation in a dream. So long as you're, you would be saying, if in your dream, if you were having this conversation with this person called Michael, you would be saying exactly the same things. And it would be very convincing what you were saying so long as you're dreaming. But when you wake up, you would recognize that Bernardo, who was having that um, conversation, and Michael, with whom he was having that conversation, were all your own projection. Oh, but from the point of view of what is, sat, chit, TWE, core yeah. subjectivity, however you want to call it, there is no external world. I, I, I granted that in the beginning. Yes. Uh, but from the point of view of seemingly individual minds, we must share a mind space. We must share a dream space. It, it uh, seems exactly, it, while we are dreaming, it seems to, that seems to be the case. When, when you're dreaming and you have a discussion with some other person, that person seems to be sharing a, your dream space. But actually that person... Not only that person, the person you take yourself to be, but Bernardo, you take yourself to be in a dream, or all your own mental creation. If we are talking about what is ultimately true, I agree with you. But now, now we are talking, we are trying to figure out 
a language to communicate within the illusion, right? Yes, Which is yes. how we have to communicate to yes. everybody else. Yes. So let me then take your example of the dream. Let me try to make it a little bit more, more, more rigorous. Okay. Um, regular dreams, I would say, don't make your case because the other figures that appear in my regular dreams do not have their own point of view within the dream. In other words, they are not seeing me. They only exist as far as I am creating their image within my dream. The only entity that truly exists experiencing the dream environment is my, my avatar within the dream. Everybody else is a construction of my dreamy mind that doesn't have its own point of view. I mean, if I, if I, if I dream at night that there is a pink elephant in my living room, I don't think that means that there is something it is like to be the pink elephant. I don't think the pink elephant has its own conscious point of view uh, towards the living room that, that I'm dreaming up. But when people have dissociative identity disorder, one quarter of them have dreams in which multiple dream characters do have their own personal point of view within the dream and they interact with one another within the dream. How do we know this? Because when the person awakes and then reports on their dream life to the therapist, depending on which outer personality is reporting the dream, the therapist hears about the same dream he heard before, but narrated from a different point of view. So authors can interact, see one another, even club each other over the head um, in, in a shared dream. If it's a dissociated, personality, a dissociated identity disorder dream. But then in the language of the dream, there, there indeed is a shared world from the point of view of each alter partaking in the dream. When in the dream of one person, uh, I, I take this example because it's in the literature and, and it's a phenomenal example. One alter personality picks up, picks up a club and clubs another outer personality over the head in the dream. And both can narrate the dream from their own point of view. One outer narrates the dream as I picked up the club and I hit that guy. Mm. And the other outer says, well, I was there doing my business and then I got clubbed over my head. Somebody clubbed me over the head. What is the club? The club is a shared mental element, not real in the sense of having standalone existence. It's a mental process. But that mental process is an element of a shared dream reality, reality in which every altar partakes. So from the point of view of the altar, there is indeed a, a objective, from their point of view, an objective world, even though that world is itself a mental process, an element of the shared dream. So I think our condition right now is similar to what I just described. You and I are alters of the mind of nature. And when I pick up this computer to talk to you, and you, you pick up your computer to talk to me, these two computers are indeed beyond the boundaries, the dissociative boundaries of our alters. And they do constitute a shared world, a shared dreamed world, but shared uh, and nonetheless. That would be my contention. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that that's uh, an interesting um, an interesting case you 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 say. But um, for most of us, we have no um, first hand experience of of having multiple this um, what is called this dissociative. Uh, well, we have first hand experience of talking to one another, sharing a yes, language, yes. sharing a, the internet to talk yes. to one another. But what I'm going to suggest is, though it's interesting the case you bring up, let us leave that aside for the time being and talk about an ordinary dream. In an ordinary dream, you experience your. You say the only one who's 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 real in the dream is your avatar. That is not the case. Your avatar is as much a, a projection as every other person in the dream. What makes your avatar seem special is that you identify yourself as, I am this avatar, I am this Bernardo. Um, but 
the one who is experiencing the dream is not the avatar, is not the person we take ourselves to be in the dream. The one who is experiencing the dream is the dreamer. The dreamer is it is dreaming itself to be a person within the dream, but the person is, is we take ourselves to be. This applies not only to dream but also to waking. The person we take ourselves to be is is an object experienced by us. We just happen to identify ourselves with that object and say, I am this person. So in, in the case of dream, while we're dreaming, if you were, as I say, if we were having this discussion in dream, I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but because my, my, my whole life is philosophy, I often have discussions like this in dream. And I often say, if, supposing we were in a dream now, and I what exactly the same argument I'm giving now, I give that argument in the dream, because the dream seems to be so real while we're dreaming. But in philosophy, we have this, this handy expression. Is there something it is like to be? Yes, yeah, I am familiar with that. Yeah. Is there something it is like to be this bottle? Yes. Most people would say, no, the bottle has doesn't have its own private conscious point of view yes. into the world. Yes. So the question is, when we are having a regular dream at night, suppose I'm having a regular dream at night, and then um, another person walks into the room, and I have a conversation with that other person in my normal regular nightly dream. Yes. Is, there is certainly something it is like to be my dream avatar. Because right. I experience the point of view of my dream avatar. Yeah. But in a regular dream, is there something it is like to be the other person that walks into the room? I would in, say in a regular dream, no, that, that person your, exists. Your, that's a judgment from your perspective in this okay. state. But, but in dream, it, you take that other person to... Supposing yes. you were having this discussion with the same with Michael in a, in a dream... It would seem to you, but there's something it's like to be Michael. Yes, yes. I, I, I don't deny the appearances. Mm, yes. But the question is, what is actually going on? Does Michael in my dream have his own conscious point of view? Or is the Michael in my dream only my own construction, my own projection of myself? Right. And exists only in so far as I perceive Michael. But there is yeah. nothing it's like to be Michael. So there are two possibilities. Yes. Either Michael does have his own point of view or he doesn't yes yes in one case if michael does not have his own point of view it's a regular dream in the other case we have the other scenario i described which is the the dissociative identity yes. disorder okay. dream <laughs> i would right. suppose that you grant that in this dream that we are sharing right now you grant that i have my own point of view into it which is different from yours right now you, you are seeing your computer screen, I'm seeing my computer screen, and we are in different parts of the world. Yes. So there is something it is like to be Bernardo right now, and there is something it is like to be Michael right now. Do you grant that? So it seems. Then we are in the DID dream, and then I would go back to my argument. In the DID dream, there is a shared environment that the authors partake in. I didn't say that was the case. I said, so it seems. But it seems exactly the same case while we are dreaming. So do I have, am I conscious from, from your perspective right now? Do you think there is it, something it is like to be Bernardo right now? It's, it certainly seems to me to be the case. But, but that, do just you think because it, it seems to me to be the case doesn't mean it is actually the case. Yes, I, I agree with that. But in your opinion, is there something it is like to be Bernardo right now? In reality. Okay. Um, Obviously, it would, that that is, we can understand that all this is a dream, and live in because we are a part of this dream. We live in this dream as a part of a dream, and as a part of a dream, it seems to us that every other person has a point of view. We obviously have to behave in the dream as if every other person has a point of view. We we don't, if we see someone, a hungry person, we give them food because they're experiencing, in our view, they're experiencing hungry, hunger. If we see someone who's had an accident 
and is badly injured. We don't just walk past them thinking, oh, it's a, it's a, um, this person is just my own mental projection. In this dream, even if we, even if we genuinely believe this is a dream, we can still, we still uh, feel the compassion for that person because that the, the suffering we see in that person we, appears to us to be exactly the same suffering we would be undergoing if we were in that uh, position. So we behave in this world as if there are multiple egos. We have to. It would be inappropriate not to. But that that is that is a mundane um for mundane purposes but we are now talking about metaphysics from the, the actual all of this all the multiplicity of people in in, in this present state all all appear in whose view in the view of that which is experiencing yeah, I, I, I am with you there michael yeah. I, I, i'm i'm not saying that I am something other than what you are. I, yeah. I don't think that is the case yeah. at all. Yeah. I think no. the consciousness looking out from my eyes is the same consciousness looking out from your eyes. And it so is it talking seems. to itself right now. So it seems. <laughs> but that's the <laughs> thing. So the question is, regardless of the ultimate metaphysical reality of the self, whatever yeah. it is, in the universe, in the, in, in the sum total of what is the case, in the sum total of reality, from your perspective, do you grant that there is the experience of a person sitting in a study in, in the attic of a house in the Netherlands, looking at a screen right now and seeing your image? Does that experience exist in, in the sum total of reality right now? To me, it se so it seems to me. But does but it or does it, it not in your me, view? I question that. But, but now, if you now say... it, it seems to you that there's one person, Michael, here who is sentient, but actually it seems to me that Michael is sentient. But is Michael actually sentient? Is Michael aware of anything? I would I not only question whether Bernardo's aware of anything, I also question whether Michael is aware of anything. Michael seems to be aware of all this because I identify myself as I am Michael. If I was identifying myself as I am Bernardo, Bernardo would seem to be seeing all this. And because I take, because I identify my, I as ego, identify myself as a person, every other person seems to me to be an ego just like me. Even if every other person is the same ego or the same consciousness, it is important for us to have a view whether this one consciousness is also experiencing the world from that other point of view. Even if it is the same consciousness, there is a difference if that consciousness is taking only my point of view or is also the same consciousness taking the point of view of the Ukrainians on the front line right now. I think it's crucial for us to have an idea or at least a view inside ourselves whether that is the case. I think that the consciousness of those Ukrainians on the front lines are the same consciousness as mine. But I think there is something it is like to be them. I think my consciousness is experiencing the world right now through their eyes. I, and, I, and that is the source of my compassion. Because if I thought that the one consciousness of nature is only experiencing the world through my point of view, I would not hesitate to kill and maim and harm and dismiss because really, those other people only exist in so far as my perception of them. I'm not looking out into the world through their eyes. So why really, would I care? Could you really do that? If you, I were... You, you can, you, in, in a dream, supposing the thought occurs to you, um, this is just a dream. Do you then go and trample over people? Could you could you stick a knife in someone? No, you couldn't. It's, it's just not our nature because, to do because, so. Because I believe during the dream, that there is something it is like to be the other dream characters. But if I become metaconscious in the dream, or lucid dreaming, as we call it, if I become lucid in my dream, and I know that the other characters are projections of my own mind, yes, I wouldn't hesitate cutting off their heads. 
it's uh, it's just fun. I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to do so. I wouldn't be able to do so because so long as we are identified with this body, so long as this I is identified with a particular body, every other body seems to be an I. Michael, it's all over the world right now. People are blowing each other to pieces. I know, I know. Shredding I know. each other it, to it, pieces. I, I, I shudder when I see it. How, how people are able to do this. I, I it's just, I, it's that, you, but one thing that, that is, one thing I have learned while following this spiritual path, the deeper we go within, the more we detach ourselves from the person we seem to be. And the more we detach ourselves from the person we seem to be, the more compassionate we come, become. So even if I thought, um, now, now there are robots, but look, they, um, we, we see robots that have face like a human being and that talk. And uh, though I know that is just a robot, I couldn't punch that robot in the face. No, I could. But I, I, I would I have no problem disassembling I, I the robot to, I, I to I every single because, bit. Because that robot seems so lifelike. I know, of course, I, I, I know that that robot is just a, a machine. But still, because of the, if it was, if it was a obviously unlifelike robot, if it was just a, um, then okay, you can you can hit it. But when when it's all the features of the face, all the expressions and the smiles and the the the, the eyes of the light, the, the the window to the soul, the, those robots they make them so realistic now. It's like you're looking at a living eye. But you are so, you are comparing a robot. To a human no, but, being. Uh, what I no, but no, but I no, what I'm saying is, but that is I'm talking about compassion. S whether others are aware or not, because they seem to us to be aware, like us. That that is I I I deny not only but other people. I mean, according to Bhagavan's philosophy, it's not only other people who are not aware, even this person I take myself to be is not aware. What is aware is the ego that is aware of itself as I am this person. When we separate, our, when by going deeper and deeper within, we separate ourselves more and more from this person we take ourselves to be, that doesn't result in being less compassionate, that results in being more compassionate. Because we, be see my... ourself, we see ourselves in others. That I, has I... not been my path at all. My path has been your consciousness is the same consciousness that is in, that is in here. I am you and you are me. I, I there absolutely is... agree. That is so how it, it is... seems to be. For me, this is what it is. Okay. Right. Uh, so <laughs> I, 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 yeah. This constant effort to make, to make the inner life of other people and appearance, I experienced that as appalling. I have never had a discussion in which this has come up. <laughs> I, 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 I find it appalling, the, the, even the suggestion to deny the inner life of another person, because my path has been all the other people are experiencing the world from their point of view, and they are me. So it matters to uh, me I, how they are experiencing the world. Not for a moment do we contemplate the idea that they are just robots or, or no. just e extrinsic appearances without inner life and, and that I feel compassionate to them just because they seem to be conscious. No, I okay, feel okay. compassion to them because it's my lived reality that they are conscious and that they are me. I'm 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 confounded and surprised. Okay, okay. Uh, um, now it seems to me, uh, I just try to uh, clarify. It seems to me, but I am Michael, and because I seem to be Michael, Michael seems to be aware of this world. Because Michael seems to be aware of this world, every other uh, person in this world seems to be aware of the world also. But what I am denying, what, 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 what I'm questioning, let's say, rather than that, what I'm questioning, is Michael actually aware? If I consider it deeply, Michael is not aware of anything. 
there is something in there is something called I, but is aware of itself as I am Michael. That I is what is aware of the world. It's only when we detach ourselves to this extent that we can begin to question these things more deeply. But, but so long as we are looking outwards to all appearances, others are sentient, and I, I. I have I have relationships, I have wife, I have friends, I have so many people. I behave in this world as if all those people are real. That there's no other way of doing it. I mean, it would be it would be lunacy to behave in, but we are now questioning more deeply. It's not we're beginning to question the whole appear, not just the about the the um the internal subjectivity experience of other people, we are beginning to question the whole of entire appearance. Does any of this exist independent of my perception of it? But there's Not a in reason the form for you this. perceive it, but certainly it exists in some form independent of your perception. Everything seems to suggest that, otherwise we wouldn't be sharing a language. Look, I, I understand the, the, the differentiation you're trying to make between appearance and illusion and reality as it really is but mm. when it comes to suffering mm. the illusion of suffering is the suffering it, that, it, 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 i agree absolutely that is how it seems to be so that is what that no no the seeming the compassion. seeming of suffering is the suffering so yes. to say to, to say that well, the suffering is not real, it's just an appearance, it's just a seeming. It doesn't deny the suffering, because the seeming of suffering is suffering. Yes. And, and, and we, how can we deny the suffering of other people? If we see, if we see others suffering, we, we suffer to see others suffering. But you don't uh, grant reality to, to the suffering experience from their own point of view. I don't... Grant, I, I question, let, let's say, rather than talking about granting, I question the reality of my own experience. And questioning the reality of my own experience I, entails I questioning you. the reality of all, all experience. It appears only, that is, as I said at the beginning, we need to distinguish between what actually exists and what seems to exist. Now, when we rise as ego, we experience the seeming existence of this world, the seeming existence of so many people, so many animals. We see suffering and all these things. We, we, we are pained to see suffering. So all this seems to be real. And so we behave in this world accordingly, as if there are many, as if every person has a point of view, every person is has a subjectivity. So long as we're looking outwards, for all intents and purposes, that is true. But now we are questioning something deeper than that. Is all this appearance, does, does this exist independent of my perception of it? No, suffering doesn't exist independent of one's suffering. But yes. It still suffers. It's still an experience. From it its is, own it, point of it view, it is an experience, and, and, and whether it's illusory or not, it doesn't matter the least because the seeming of suffering is the suffering. Okay, but in the spiritual path, we are trying to question the reality of the experiencer. That has not been my path. My okay. path has been the path of understanding that the consciousness looking out into the world from every pair of eyes is me. So their suffering is real. It's being experienced, illusory or not. It's being experienced as suffering. And that suffering is mine. And I'll inherit all of that when I die and my dissociation ends. That has been my path. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say this to you, but uh, to, to the audience, I find the kind of spiritual abstraction you're suggesting tremendously dangerous In when you abstract hands, away when when you abstract spiritually abstract away the reality of the human experience although in your case you say that the seeming is enough for you to behave as if it were true the, the mere fact that you're even questioning the reality of other people's suffering and giving it some kind of spiritual legitimacy that lays the groundwork for a Hitler, for a Putin. 
yes, but th th this philosophy will not appeal to such people because this philosophy is about questioning the reality. First and foremost, before we question the reality of other people's experience, we need to question the reality of ourself as the experiencer. That is what this what this part this this um spiritual part is about questioning our own reality. But and your path mm -hmm. seems to be a path that brings you away from reality because you're questioning reality all the time and sort of rarefying reality into more and more levels of yes, yes, abstraction. My path has been very different and I still call it spiritual. Maybe I call it yes. a soul path. My path has been a dive into the actual nature of reality, into the right. shared being of human beings. Uh, so it's the opposite direction. Actually, I think the, the path of abstraction, I identify a lot with the path of some sciences, like theoretical physics, that turns everything into an abstraction. And that sounds more similar to me, to, to what you're doing, uh, than the path you're following, than, than what I consider to be my path which is the path of seeing myself behind the eyes of everybody else. Yes, that is... Uh, I, my experience is very much the same as yours, because in, 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 in my experience, when I, see some, when I see suffering, I suffer to see suffering, because it seems to me so real. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating... Um, lack of compassion. I mean, if anyone truly follows this path, that, that, that is this path that Bhagavan taught of turning within, the more we turn within, the more we detach ourselves from the person we seem to be. So the more we see ourselves in others. So compassion grows more and more the deeper we go within. This may seem paradoxical, but that is the actual experience. But that doesn't prevent that, that, that compassion doesn't, I mean, that compassion is the fruit of going within more and more and more. The more we detach ourselves from the, someone like Hitler or Stalin or someone, they are very, very strong ego, very, very strong identification. I am such and such a person. And th th that's how they other people, like the, the way Hitler othered the Jews. He, he in his he he reduced Jews to non-humans. He de completely dehumanized them because of his strong identification with what he took himself to be. But the more we, because this is a this is the result of of strong attachment, strong identification. But the more we go within, the more we are dissolving our own identity. And so the, the more we are able to see ourselves in all others, so we're not able to other anyone. So I, what you're saying, I understand exactly what you're saying. That is also my experience. But what I'm talking about is something different. That is about within this, this uh, our experience, there are... There are the appearance of others. The others seem to be every bit as sentient as we seem to be. I'm not questioning that. And as I say, when I question the... I'm not questioning... So long as it, all this is... So long as we're looking outwards, we, I, we seem to be a person and there seem to be other people. What I'm questioning is all this... Is an is an appearance? Does it have any? Does I, I'm not as I said earlier. I'm not only questioning the about others. I'm questioning primarily about myself. What what am I now? I seem to be this person, Michael. So long as I seem to be Michael, there seem to be so many other people, and they seem to be just like me, suffering, and all of that. And I I I I feel compassion when I hear the news of what is happening, for example, in Ukraine or in the Middle East or in Yemen, all this, it's its so painful to hear, hear this, that pe what people do to each other. It's, 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 it's just so painful to hear it. But so 
so long as we're looking out, because all this seems to be very true, but if we want to get, if we want to penetrate beneath the surface, we need to begin questioning not only the appearance, but the one to whom it all appears. The, the appearance of suffering is the suffering. To deny the appearance is to yes, deny the suffering. Yeah, I, I, I'm not denying the appearance of suffering. I'm questioning whether I, I'm the, the, and for, in order for there to be to be an appearance of anything, whether of joy or suffering or whatever it may be, there must be one to whom all that appears. So whatever we cannot know the truth of what appears without knowing the truth of the one to whom it appears. So in this spiritual path, we are trying to question our own reality. When we begin to question our own reality, first we have to detach ourselves. First we need to understand that we are not what we seem to be. Now we seem to be a person, we seem to be a body. I seem to be sitting here. I'm lo limited within a certain um I, I understand you. I just can't follow you there. Space. So, but I, when we are questioning our... So we are not what we seem to be. So then what are we? When we go within more and more, we detach ourselves from this appearance and we are able to... Uh, it's very I know what you're saying. In, yeah. I understand it. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that has been the journey of Western philosophy for centuries. Abstraction yeah. on top of abstraction on top of abstraction. That's not my path. But my path not, to understand is... reality is to dive head on into the reality of experience, okay. into but... the reality of being human, of being one of eight billion. I, I can't follow you there. Okay. I, I'm, it, it, that I'm here still talking to you is pays homage to your kindness, to 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 the wisdom you seem to 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 project uh, as well because i would be gone 10 minutes ago the moment you raised question about the reality of other people's experience because i would say well if you if you question the reality of my experience of being talking to you why are you talking to me if i am yeah. just a projection of your dream why are we even doing this why are we having a discussion it's like right. having a conference of solipsists <laughs> i mean now you see it's a, it's an internally contradictory thing so I, I can't follow you there, Michael. I, I, okay. you, you, the, it doesn't matter which way you formulate okay. it. I, I okay. cannot go there because okay. it's the antithesis of my own path. Okay. C can I say something then um, on what you say about abstraction? This is diving into a reality because ultimately what is all, all that is experienced appears is an appearance. The, the experiencer of all that is experienced, that which experiences, in other words, uh, the I that is experiencing all this, is itself an appearance. The reality is, 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 is that which is shining within that experiencer as I am. That which is as shiny as I am within that experiencer is what is shining within everything else. The more we go within, the more we, as I say, the more we see ourselves in others. So I, I'm, it, it's very difficult to put these things into words. It's <laughs> to you, it sounds like an abstraction, but it is not because what is the, what is the, okay, let us take for granted. We're all experiencing. What is the core experience of each and every one of us? It is I am. Before we can experience anything else, we first experience our own existence. We can't have an identity without first being aware of our own existence. So we're first aware I am, then the experience I am Bernardo or I am Michael, that is a secondary experience. So we... That, that is, Bhagavan's path is about going away from this secondary experience to dive back into the primary experience, which is the ultimate reality, which is the reality of all things. Look, regardless of which metaphysics is correct about the nature yeah. of the self or the nature of experience, yeah. let's say 
all suffering is an illusion. Let's say that. Let's say all suffering is an illusion. It still matters whether those other people are having the illusion of suffering or not, because the illusion of suffering is the suffering. It feels the same way. Yes, Even yes. if it is an illusion, it matters. So it matters whether we acknowledge or deny the illusory suffering of the other people, regardless of what their true self is. Okay. Is I, that experience unfolding in the universe? Is that experience unfolding or is it not? To open the door to say, no, that experience is not really unfolding, I find it outrageous. Okay. Th that is why I say that is so long as we identify ourselves as a person, we, we see the existence of other people. Those other people and all those their experiences seem to us every bit as real as our own experiences. I absolutely agree with that. And that is why we all naturally feel compassion. We, we care for others. We, we give time to others. We, we are patient with others. We, are, we, we empathize with their sufferings, with their bereavements, with all these things. This is, this is part of this, this um, experience of being a person. But what I'm questioning is whether our experience of ourself is, I'm not saying there is no experience, there certainly seems to be, but is that the ultimate truth? So that's long, not what I'm, that's so, just not my so, point. So I, as, I don't care whether it's the ultimate truth or not. My question is, are we denying the illusion of suffering that I'm not other people undergo? I'm not denying the illusion. That is why I said it seems to be. But just because it seems to be doesn't mean what, but it is actually what is. But so long as we identify ourselves as a person, there seem to be so many other people who seem to be just as sentient as this person seems to be. So their, their suffering, it, others certainly seem to be suffering. And it, their suffering is as real as our suffering. I'm not denying that. Uh, I, I, I what follow I'm, you conceptually. Yes, I, I follow your logic, but but this isn't I, I just logic. There. It's also the heart. I mean, <laughs> as I said, you, I, it may sound very cold to you what I'm saying, a very cold, detached. But actually, but as I say, the more detached we become from a person we seem to be, the more overwhelmingly compassionate we feel towards others. We, 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 although you that's why I said although, I, I, although I their experiences are just seeming <laughs> they don't really experience <laughs> how can yeah, I mean that even no, my own I, I cannot even, square this circle no even, even my own experience is a seeming is seeming I'm the not seeming saying, of suffering is the suffering is the, the question suffering. is I do agree. you deny the seeming of suffering we, we of other all people experience suffering that doesn't mean the suffering is ultimately real, but so long as we are suffering, oh, the suffering matter. Is very, seems very real to us. I'm not it denying. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's ultimately real. The question is, are other people having this ultimately unreal experience we call suffering? Yes. I, and I, to open I, the door to say that. they I'm may not. not if they, well, you just I, said I, they seem to have, and, and you stick to that. I, they seem to have in exactly the same way, but I seem to suffer. I understand the logic, <laughs> but I can't go there. It, um, <laughs> look, okay. it, no, Michael, it, it's not a secret that I'm not an enlightened being. Uh, yes. This this is well known. My my weaknesses are well known. Uh, I, but right I, now, I don't. If I, I don't know if this is enlightenment, I don't want to go. I don't want to no, go. No, no, I I am not an enlightened being. I'm not pretending. I'm not pretend claiming anything like that. But what I um, Jesus's enlightenment seems to have been diametrically opposite to this it is the full acknowledgement that the suffering of everyone was his suffering and therefore he paid for everybody else's sins it, that's the yeah. ultimate uh, christian idea right the suffering of everyone is the suffering of the christ yes and what i hear from you is is the precise opposite nobody else may actually be suffering they only seem to be suffering i, I can't go there it's not nobody else i 
that's what I say. That I, if, if I'm not saying my suffering is the only suffering, as, as real as my suffering seems to be, other people's suffering seems to me to be real. But just because something seems to be real doesn't mean that ultimately it is real. But so long as I take myself to be this person, I seem to suffer. And so I, I grant as much reality to the suffering of others that I grant to myself, to, to my own suffering. And to me... Uh, I can only repeat it, myself. The seeming of suffering is the suffering. I, so. I agree. I agree. I agree. But I'm not denying that. That's what... What is the? It is to, the aim of the spiritual path. Ultimately, is to go beyond suffering, go beyond this this illusion. That was not but the path so of Jesus, right? So long as we right? are wrapped up in the illusion, we can, we 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 can question whether it is real. But it it doesn't stop seeming to be real until we, so long as we are caught up in this illusion. That, that, that... Okay, I think we exhausted this particular point yeah. uh, okay. because we are repeating ourselves, but uh, yeah. I can share one thing more with you. The aim of my spiritual path is not to stop suffering. I gave up on that a couple of years ago after 15 years trying because I realized at some point, and maybe it's my own delusion, I don't know whether it's ultimately true, but it, it, it is my, my own maybe uh, faulty uh, insight that uh, none of this is about me. Why yeah. will I make it the aim of my spiritual path to stop suffering? Doing that is making my entire life about me and my little need to stop my suffering. But why would that be the purpose of nature? It's like a little blossom in my apple tree in the spring saying, my life is about me, therefore I shall never die. Well, if the uh -huh. blossom could have its way, there would be no apples and no apple trees after a very short time. Yeah. For me, the search, my spiritual search is the search for meaning, not the the search to stop suffering. I think I think the need to stop suffering is an egotistic thing. It's making the whole play of nature being about us. So, I, I, so I'm I'm not criticizing your search. Yeah. I've suffered enough to know yeah. that there come moments in our lives where where nothing can take priority over the need to stop suffering. Twice, I made plans mm. to kill myself. For very concrete, I thought I'm half an hour away from ending this. Twice in my life, uh, this happened. So I'm not unacquainted with the overwhelming need to stop suffering that comes uh, in life to everyone, probably. Uh, but if we are talking about ultimate truths, my conclusion is that it is not at all about my stop suffering. On the contrary, Suffering, I mean, there is suffering behind each one of my 11 books. If I never suffered, I would never have written. I would never have gotten the meaning that per permeates, percolates my entire life today. The sense of worthy, the sense, not personal worthy, but the sense of this was for something. This was not for nothing. The sense of matured, having matured, have, having had the insights. So... Yeah, it's a different perspective. To me, okay. it's not about stopping, stop suffering. No, on the contrary. I mean, and 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 look in the West at the origins of Western Christianity. That was the example, right? There was a guy who went straight into the suffering because there was a higher meaning uh, to that. So I I feel myself not but, alone. <laughs> okay, okay, but uh, according to Advaita, the way beyond suffering. So long as we, so long as our life is about me, like, suffering is inevitable. The way to go, the only way to go beyond suffering is to go beyond this little me. So it's not about, this isn't about, um, that is salvation is not personal. It is, we are saved from the illusion that we are a person. That is how we go beyond suffering. But, but the motivation to, to do it in the first place is probably to stop suffering. Yes, I mean, it's yes. one of the well, four uh, uh, noble truths, right? Yes. <laughs> Life and is it's suffering. Also, and... Bhagavan begins his teaching. But one thing we are all seeking is happiness free of misery. That is our very nature. Because our real nature is infinite happiness. 
devoid of misery. So long as we limit ourselves, we, we are separating ourselves from the infinite happiness, the infinite satisfaction that is our own real nature. So dissatisfaction, which is another word for suffering, dissatisfaction is the very nature of ego. So to go beyond suffering means to go beyond ego. Without, I, I we, completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I completely agree with you when you say our life isn't just about this me. That that is one hundred percent. I agree with you. To or the it, suffering uh, and happiness of this me. It's not about that yeah, either. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, um, I, I think sometimes we oppress people when we get this message across that uh, one they shouldn't be suffering and two they can't stop suffering. It's, you put a responsibility on the shoulders of people that even Atlas couldn't bear. It's the weight yeah. of the world. How can you control all the variables of nature? that have a direct influence in our ability to suffer or not, or to be happy or not, it's impossible. Mm. I, I think it's oppressive for us to mm. say the meaning of our lives is to be happy and stop suffering. What about if it's not about that at all? What if that's not what nature is at all? What if life is a kind of a, a sacrificial thing? We are here to play our role in the grand scheme of nature. And whether that makes us suffer or whether that makes us happy, may be insignificant. But the drive for happiness is what is driving all our... Ultimately, we are all seeking happiness. Not Whatever me. We, hmm? I can put my hand on my heart and tell you that's not what I'm seeking. What I'm seeking is meaning. Okay. Are you happy when you get that meaning? I am relieved when I get that meaning. Relief is I... happiness. Because relief is relief from the desire. When we desire something, when we achieve what we desire, we are relieved from that desire. And so we experience... Oh, no, that, that's not my experience. My experience is not that I achieved what I desire. My experience is I've completed something I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I, so made, you... I, I was not happy doing it, but at least I did it. And I was supposed to do that. Okay, I feel relieved. Next round. Here we go again. Yeah, 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 yeah. That That is the... But, but, when you feel relieved, does that does that relief not uh, do you not experience that relief as happiness? Well, it's it, it's a matter of choice of words. Um, we have two words: happiness and relief, and we seem to mean different things. Otherwise, we would be using the same word. Yeah. I understand that there is a relationship between yeah, relief that, and happiness, but I do not acknowledge that there is a full overlap between the meanings yeah. of both words. I don't experience my sense of relief as what I would characterize as happiness. I feel it as what the word says, relief. Okay. <laughs> like taking a weight off my shoulders a little bit, so I can, okay, I can take a breath of air, and now the next thing. That's how I experience it. Right. And, and I'm perfectly okay with it. I, I stopped yeah. struggling with the idea that I had to be happy because my life is about me. No, that gone, that flew away. It's okay to suffer. My diamond makes me suffer every day. Some days in particular. And it's all right. It's not about me. Who cares if Bernardo is suffering? Who gives a damn? Well, <laughs> Why <I> would they? <laughs> I mean, only so far as they know that they are me, they give a damn. And now that, to me, is the key spiritual insight. Mm. There is no conceptual reason for anybody to give a damn about my suffering. But there is a felt reason. When yes, they realize yes. in their body, in their soul, really that embodied realization that the one suffering here is them. Yes, exactly, exactly. Can I just, um, to put what all that I said in perspective, can I sure. say something about Bhagavan? Just one incident from Bhagavan's life that illustrates how... But his supreme compassion. When he was a young man living on the, in a cave on the hill, he often used to wander over the hill. Means Aaron actually. He often used to wander over the hill uh, here and there. And one day when he was uh, wandering on the hill, that hill behind you, right? Yes, the hill behind me, on the 
far side of the hill. This is the south, what you can see is the south side. On, when he was walking on the north side of the hill, he was crossing a, a dry um a, a, a dry stream bed. And he there he saw a particularly large uh, banyan leaf. And there is a story in the Arunachala. Um, in the Purana, in the stories about Arunachala, but on the north side of the hill, under a banyan tree, Arunachala is sitting in the form of a yogi called Aranagiri Yogi, but who is also associated with Dakshinamurti, the, the Shiva in the form of uh, Guru. So seeing this leaf, Bhagavan remembered this, this story and he looked up further up, he saw a big banyan tree. So he started walking up the dry stream bed, but at a certain point, because of the bushes and things, he had to climb out of the dry stream bed uh, in order to proceed further up. As he was climbing out of the dry stream bed, his thigh, uh, his right thigh brush brushed against uh, a bush. And unknown to him, in that bush was a hornet's nest. So the hornets, because their nest was disturbed, they all swarmed out. So he stood there and he let them sting his thigh. Because he st stood motionless, they didn't sting any part of his body except the thigh that had um, brushed against their nest. And literally hundreds of, of uh, hornets stings he got in his leg. until And he stood there bearing the pain until they, um, until their anger abated. And then he, with extreme pain, he slowly, slowly hobbled back to the cave where he was living with some other sadhus. After several days, the swelling began to subside. And um, when the swelling had subsided enough, they, the other sadhus were able to use a pair of cutting pliers to remove the hornet stings from his leg, one by one. And there were literally hundreds of them, in that, just in that one thigh. He was asked about this afterwards in a verse by a devotee called Murugan. I asked him, why was it when the, it, uh, your, uh, when the, it, was it was an accident, why when this action happened accidentally, did you take on yourself the suffering as a consequence of it? And Bhagavan replied, what sort of mind would, though it was unintentional, what sort of mind or what sort of heart would it be if it didn't feel such compassion? So his compassion was so great, he felt compassionate for those hornets to such an extent that he allowed them to, to to sting his thigh to their satisfaction. So though what I say may sound very, uh, very cold and very heartless, it is, it is not detached from this, from the lived experience in this world. If we are truly following this path of going within, when we allow our mind to go outwards, we will naturally feel a compassion for all sentient beings. It, it, it's just the nature of things. Because, as I said earlier, the more we detach ourselves, the, the more I, our identification with the one particular person that we seem to be, the more this identification is dissolved, the more we will see ourselves in all others. Um. It may seem yeah, paradoxical I mean, I'm, I'm, compared to what I'm to, compared to what I was trying to explain. Maybe I wasn't explaining it well, but this is the actual lived experience. The example I understand the spirit of the example of the hornets. I, I couldn't help thinking that each one of those hornets died an agonizing death because that's what happens to hornets when they sting. They leave the sting behind with part of their entrails. So by letting them stinging him, he made sure hundreds of hornets died in agony. But uh, that was not the spirit. I I, I understand this. It, uh, it the spirit of what you said is clear. Maybe another example would sound better to people who know about hornets, um, because I felt compassion for the hornets, uh, hornets uh, stinging him. 
Um, but but yeah, I, I I understand the spirit, and and to me, what that means is that uh, he could not have questioned the felt reality, illusory or not, of the inner life of other beings. Because if he really questioned that, where would this compassion have come from? If you doubt the inner life of other living beings, then you ought to doubt compassion because it's the sharing of inner lives, the reality of somebody else's inner lives that motivates compassion to begin with. Compassion, compassion, is yeah, to yeah. feel with. Yes. To feel with entails that the other person is feeling too because otherwise there's nothing to feel with. Yes. But yeah, okay, we, we both made our point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I think I I want to have a dinner. <laughs> it's right. been a, we've been at it for three hours, I confess. Okay. I'm a little bit... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a very, very interesting discussion. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes it got a little bit heated also, but I think that makes it a good discussion, of course, to question each other. And I was also, because Bernardo, you asked some critical questions just as, I'm very familiar with Bhagavan's teachings. So your questions were also challenging for me. And um, um, what I, just as a, someone who also follows the path of Bhagavan, I, I always have a jada in mind. Eh? Your pure consciousness and the nature of pure consciousness is Satchit Ananda. And um, which means also, for example, the end of suffering. Eh? Your true nature is happiness. Um, so I always keep that kind of in mind because I believe that's the ultimate truth. So um, as Bhagavan, and there was a lot of questions about seeing other suffering, but Bhagavan would sometimes eh, say something like, there is no other, there's only yourself as, as I am, a pure consciousness being. And because you only experience yourself, that's the ultimate compassion, for example. So that's my interpretation, of course, of, um, of, of Bhagavan's teachings. Um, but yeah, I would like to thank you both very, very much for having this discussion. And it will probably lead to all kinds of comments when it's posted on YouTube. <laughs> And if you like, uh, Bernardo, I, um, I'm very thankful that you um, were, were, were joining this meeting, that you were willing to, to have this meeting. And as a personal thank you, as I already told you in the beginning, um, Bhagavan wrote a book or wrote a philosophical poem um, about the nature of reality. And I recently compiled a book out of the writings and talks that Michael gave. Um, about those verses, so I would be very happy to send you that book. So afterwards, mm -hmm. I would like to mail you for your for your contact information. That's very kind. Um, of you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm very. Uh, it's my pleasure to do that. Um, so then, rest me nothing else but to thank you both for being in this meeting. And um, yeah, till next time, probably. Thank both. Perhaps. Thank both of you. Okay. Yeah. Thank Namaste. You. Thank you. Namaste. Take care. Yeah. Namaste. Yeah, take care.